everybody, my name is Martin. I'm from Switzerland and I love to be here. Uh, I'm super excited to see you all and it's going to be a great, great time. Uh, there's one thing that is not an official administrative thing, but something that I just care about a lot, which is I do this workshop for you. It's not for me, right? So if you have any questions or if there's anything unclear or anything not working, it is my fault, not yours. So please, 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 please. Tell me if something's unclear or something doesn't make sense or something doesn't work because then we can fix it together. That's why I'm here for. Uh, if you wouldn't ask questions or like say something doesn't work on my computer or something like that, then you could as well just watch a YouTube video or something. So I think the, it makes the most sense to just, you know, talk to me when there's something wrong. That's what I'm here for. Or at least I hope that that's what I'm here for. Robots won't replace me anytime soon, hopefully. Um, we have a Wi-Fi, if you haven't seen that already, there's like a Shangri-La Wi-Fi. That should not require a password and it should work. <laughs> <laughs> TM. Uh, I have a fallback solution in case things are not working. Um, but it's going to be a little inconvenient to set that all up. So I'd rather try, let's, let's try Wi-Fi. If that doesn't work, then we can still fall back uh, anytime else. Like anyone having problems connecting to the Wi-Fi? No. Good. If so, let me know. If the Wi-Fi dies for you during the workshop, let me know as well. And I'll share the files with you in a different way and then we can just, you know, have it all work. Also, if things should go horribly wrong, I can always ask the organizers to help us out because they promise they have a fallback solution, which I definitely think they will have because they are well organized here, which is nice. Uh, regarding the details, there's going to be lunch at 12.30. Um, it's going to be, basically, it's, it's not as centralized as they wanted it to be, apparently. So um, we have two lunch spots. One is uh, two floors down on three. If you go that direction, you see like dine on three or something like that. And if you go around the corner, there's like a buffet restaurant. It's called uh, the Silver Shell Cafe. Alternatively, if you are more a fan of sitting at the beachfront, um, well, beachfront, the seafront more or less, you can also go completely down to floor one. And then go in that direction. Uh, there's something that's called Barnacles by the Sea. Uh, I think that's probably going to be a seafood restaurant, so that's not going to be where I am being. Um, they also have a different uh, Wi-Fi at the Barnacles by the Sea building. So if you are having lunch over there and need a Wi-Fi connection, and Shangri-La should not work, there's also the JSConf Asia uh, network with the Beware of the Cats password. So lunch is going to be at 12.30. You have drinks here. Should you feel thirsty, then just get up and get a drink. We're not in a classical classroom setting. 5.30 p.m. So 5.30 in the afternoon, there's going to be a group photo at the beach. The beach is pretty large, so I'm not exactly sure where that's going to be. But I guess we're going to work that one out. And then uh, 5.45 after the group photo, there's going to be dinner at the beach as well. Um, Yes, so toilets are available here on this floor as well as on every other floor, so that should not be a problem. Um, yeah, there should, uh, like we have been, whoops. <laughs> we have been um, promised snacks between 10 and 11, so let's see if that's helping. Um, but as I said, like if you want some water or some coffee, just grab one anytime. The coffee may be only when I'm like having you all figure out something uh, because it kind of is loud. So it's not like the best thing. I can talk over it. I can be louder than a coffee machine, but I'd rather not um, have to be. Cool. So if you have a full day workshop, you would be able to leave your stuff here. But I highly recommend taking your things with you for lunch. Uh, because I'm A, not sure where the, where the next workshop is going to be. If it's in the same room, I don't know. Um, but also, it's not guaranteed to like be locked up and stuff. So just take your things with you during lunch and then bring them back when you come back. Cool. All right. So I would say let's start. Um, I know that a few people are like doing slides and presentations and stuff, but I'm like, no, we are here for a workshop. So let's do things together. Um, and I would suggest that we that we get going uh, like this. So. Should the Wi-Fi not die, and I really, really hope it doesn't, then you should be able to go to the following URL. It should be, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make that larger in a second. Just give me a moment. Uh, the A-Frame Workshop. So if you go to this URL, and I can make that even larger. No, I can't. OK, fair enough. Jesus, this is annoying. Ah, this is better. 
So this wonderful URL should take you to a what's called a glitch. A glitch is nothing like magical or fancy. It's just a way to have like um, a really really easy setup in the browser. It's basically just serving static files, um, and that's like convenient because we don't have to set anything up. We don't have to run any software on your computer. You can just start with uh, what is there. Anyone not having this URL typed in already? Bear in mind, I have put, taken it from my brain, so it might actually not lead you to where I think it leads you. So let me, let me double check. It's the right URL. Yes. Heck yes. So if, OK, right, that was not the best idea that I had. Uh, if I go here, I should see something like this, right? So if you click on Remix Your Own, you should see dun 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 Yes, this. Now this is not very exciting and it's like the standard placeholder thing, but the interesting thing is happening in index HTML. So we want to have a look at index HTML probably. By the way, if you cannot read this, let me know and I can make that larger. Is that readable? People in the back row, give me a thumbs up or thumbs down. Good. Okay, good. As I say, like this is for you, not for me. If you have anything or anything is not making any sense, then let me know. So I, I basically set you up with some things that I just think makes sense. Like ignore all this crap here. This is like boilerplate stuff in the first couple of rows. No one cares. This is the more interesting things. We're loading a few libraries. Let's actually comment out the second one and the third one for a moment. So I'm gonna remove these two scripts and let's just load a frame. And actually, I don't know why this is still here. Let's remove the class hidden as well. I don't think it does anything, but let's remove it just for shits and giggles. So this is basically like a boring old website. So if I put in an h1 tag and say like, hello, JSConf Asia, and then an h2 tag, like how's it hanging? Um, and then we click on the little show live button, a new tab should open with our beautiful website, which is like probably the best website I've ever done. Uh, and the projector is cutting something off, I think, but okay. Um, that's not a problem, you know, it's not that exciting. So we have just like a normal HTML page, but because we have this particular thing here that's called a scene, we have some special magical powers. Actually, let's not remove that. Let's go in here. And if you press Control Alt I, and that's Control on a MacBook keyboard, it's not Command, it's Control Alt I, you should see this. Ha, huh, that's curious, isn't it? Does that work for everyone? Does it not work for you? Oh, that's interesting. Hmm. Anyone else who's not having this on screen? Control Alt. Yeah, it should be Control Alt I or Control Option I. Control Option I. Nope. nope. Okay. Well, then let's let's wait with that. Just like so. This this is basically a hint that I want to give you. There's something going on under the surface, and uh, we're gonna see what this is in a second. Let's go go back to our HTML. So I'm gonna remove all this crap for a second, and we're just gonna go in here. Now, what is this a scene? Well, um, for VR, AR, and just generally 3D content on the web, we need a way to actually express what we're going to do. And the, there's a few metaphors, right? So for instance, if you think about it, a website is not a well, web page. It's not actually a page. It's not a page in a physical book. It's not something that you can take in, into your hand. So while we are using the page abstraction or the page metaphor to work with like 2D content, we are working, or A-Frame decided to work with the scene metaphor for 3D content. And basically what it is about is, so how would you, how would you design or express 3D content um, in a way, like how do you talk about it? And the easiest way to talk about it is basically staging a theater play or staging a movie. So we have a scene, which is an empty space somewhere. So this could be my scene. And then we have objects like me. Yes, I objected my, myself earlier today. So basically, you have objects that you put in, and you can move them around, and you can make them do things, and you can you know, combine them. Like, or even like, I can move this thing around. This is an object as well, or an entity in this case. And um, I can maybe like rotate it. <laughs> that was not the best idea. There's a physics engineer at play here. Um, so yeah, I, I can rotate the objects that I have. I can. Well, I can't in the real world, but I could scale them up. I could make them larger or smaller, and I can move them around in space. So this is kind of like the thinking metaphor that we've got. And there's actually two more things. What do you also need when you do a movie? So I have a scene, and I have like actors and objects and props and stuff, right? Well, making a movie is pretty hard when you don't have a camera. 
So we have to have a camera, we have to have a scene, and we have to have objects that we are going to film. Also, if this is a closed room, it's not going to look very fancy if there's no light. So we also need light. Now, conveniently here, we have some light. So this light is shining on me, this light is shining on me, uh, and I'm an object on my scene. These objects in A-frame uh, are called um, entities. It's just a terminology. Sometimes other libraries call them differently. Um, very popular is also to call them meshes. Um, sometimes they are called objects, but for the sake of A-Frame, we're calling them uh, entities. So A-Frame, by the way, is a library from Mozilla, like super cool stuff, uh, and it's, it's making things much, much easier than they used to be. I can show you how it looked like before we were doing A-Frame. Like, we're going to do some A-Frame, and then I'll show you how it looks like when you're not having A-Frame available, and you're going to see why we're doing it in A-Frame. So our A-Scene is basically exactly this. This is empty space. There's nothing in here. OK, so now how can we fill that with something? Well, as I said, we have to put in entities, which are our objects. So let's do that. And A-Frame wraps everything in these custom HTML elements, which is like super nice. So we can say A entity. And then we have an object on our scene. But if you're like me and would now reload, you would see nothing. Well, that's unfortunate. huh? And the reason why is that an object itself does not, does not resemble anything. It's not visible. It's basically just a point in space, an invisible point in space. You don't see anything because it's not looking like anything. So what you want to do is you want to add something to it that actually makes it look like something. Well, how can we do that? Well, A-Frame does what's called the entity component model. It's uh, basically a way of, of doing things and organizing your code that game engines uh, usually use. And so we now have to add a component. And how do you add a component? Well, conveniently, it's just an attribute to our HTML tag. So we're going to start with, we want to have something that looks like something. So we probably want to start with geometry, because we want to need some, you know, we're going to need a shape. So let's give it a shape. Let's say geometry. And, um, and these components can have, good morning. Good morning. I think we finally found it. Oh, I'm so sorry. Was it not? Oh. oh. We went to the wrong raster straight. Oh. All right, you didn't miss out too much yet, so take a seat. We're going to catch you up real quick. So I was, ex I was explaining that you want to start with the following URL, and I'm going to show you the URL real quick. And from there on, you're going to go like remix, and then you can catch up. Sorry for that, we're just going to put in a, a moment's time. By the way, is anyone not having like working Wi-Fi on their computer right now and not having this working? Well, fair enough, yeah. you two excluded because you're literally just setting up. Yeah, the Shangri-La Wi-Fi should not require a password and seems to be working. All right. You're both on the on the website. Huh? You're both having the remix you button. Also remix your own. The yeah, remix, remix your own, is the button that you want to have for this. Holy crap! Why am I not seeing anything? Are you caught up as well? <coughs> okay. Perfect. Wonderful. So you click on the remix your own thing, and then you should be, oh, I'm not signed in. OK. Uh, I'm OK with that. Got it. If I lose it, I lose it. That's what happens, like living on the edge. Um, so what we also did is we, we commented out the last two scripts, because we're not going to need them right now. And we removed the class hidden from the A scene. Uh, there, there was a class on here. We removed that as well, because we're going to only use it later on. So yeah. So. Uh, as I explained, everything is an entity, but an entity doesn't look like anything by default, so we have to add this geometry component. And it's kind of nice that we don't have to like, make up our own geometries, because in 3D graphics, everything is made from triangles, so we would have to now figure out like, all the triangles all over the place. So instead of doing that, what we can do is we can use a primitive, which is basically built-in simple geometries that we can use. For instance, we can say primitive box which is going to give us all the points and connections between the points to form 
a box. Okay, that's lovely. Um, however, we're not gonna, still not going to see that. By the way, what we are looking at here is basically, so this is the entity, this is a component, and components can have multiple parameters, right? So one of these parameters is which primitive we want to pick. And it looks a little like JSON without the quote, so we can also do like, I don't know, ASDL or like foo bar or something like that. We can even do like buzz and then give it an array of things. Now obviously all these attributes are not known to the component, so we're just going to remove them. I just wanted to show you that all of these kind of things are possible. So we start with a primitive box, but now what color do you think the box will have? How does it look like? Any guesses? Transparent. Okay, transparent is one guess. Anyway, nothing? Well, what, what's, what color is nothing? Um, <laughs> white. White is a good choice. So here's the thing we don't know because A frame tries to not you know, screw us over, so it's going to pick a color at random. Which is nice. Like, this is actually nice because, you know, it, it tries to do its thing. Uh, oftentimes it's white, but it's not always white, and it's like kind of be like super confusing. Uh, so to fix that, we're just going to give it a material. So this is another component, right? We're following the same pattern here. It's a component, and this one has parameters as well. So the first thing I probably want to figure out is like, what's the color? So we can make this red. And this is nice. It, it supports a bunch of actual color names. It doesn't support all the CSS colors, I think, but it supports like most of them. Um, so we can use a color name, but we can also say 0x ff 0, 0, 0, 0. So that works. Actually, no, sorry, no, that's actually not the, no, 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 ff 0, 0, 0, 0, um, like we are used to from HTML and CSS. Um, but I, I'm going to stick with red for, for the sake of simplicity for the moment. And now what happens? Now let's see. Let's reload. Oh, nothing. <gasps> what did we do wrong? Oh my god. Now, now try to get the, try to get the uh, key command that I did earlier on. So like click on something somewhere here and then go control option I or control alt I and you should see this. Does that, it, does, it still doesn't work. What the heck? See, this is the fun thing. This is, I love it when it doesn't work because, you know, that's what I'm here for. Yes! I'm worth my money. It doesn't do anything. That's like really weird. That's like a weird thing. Why is it not doing this? A frame should be fine. It should be loading the freaking thing, but it's not. Huh. Ah, this is a fun one. No, that's okay. Well, fair enough, but. Hmm, there's no arrows here, so I'm not exactly sure why it's not. This is a fun one. Do you have any other shortcut keys? I don't think so, but we can try. So in that, that's one of the cases. So wait, uh, anyone else not seeing this particular screen? There's a few people. All right, so I'll, I've never seen that before. So I'm excited to figure out what else we can do to get this working. So I'll, I'll real quick. So by the way, this is like, if you ever have a problem with A-Frame, this is like all you want to be at. Uh, this has all the information and all the links to communities and GitHub issues and stuff. So what we're going to do is I'm going to try to figure out if there's another way to get the inspector up and running. Because what we are seeing here, these are like the built-in developer tools for A-Frame. And they are super handy. So I, it says like Control-Alt-I. So I'm not, I'm not like dumb or doing something ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. This is not coming up, so that's an interesting one. Uh, let's see if they have help here somewhere. Because I'm pretty sure there is a way to programmatically call this. All right, time to explore shit. Let's, let's do something. It's not something that I've prepared, but pff, you know, this is the stuff I live for. It's like the adventures. Let's go on an adventure. Let's get our A scene and ask what components up are. Okay, fair enough. I saw that coming. So let's see. Dot components. Dot inspector. Does this thing have something that I can work with? Initialized is playing true, uh-huh. What the hell? 
Right, let me reload this because you're not at this point where the inspector is actually loaded. So let's try this. So without the inspector being loaded, it has the exact same details here. <laughs> That's a weird one. Okay, so it doesn't seem to be having a method that I could call unless it's not showing. Oh, show. <laughs> Let, let me let me try something. Let's let, what happens when I do this? Okay, nothing. That's perfect. What happens when I do this? Nothing. That's perfect. What happens when I do update? No. Okay. Fair enough. Let's try this one then. Does it have like systems? Maybe. Let's see. No, it does not. Okay. Cool. So the inspector is a component, which is nice. What kind of data does it have? It only has a URL, so that's not really helpful. Okay, cool. Let's have a look at the component in here because it must have some sort of method. So th this is actually not part of the regular workshop, but I think we can squeeze this one in because it's just going to be interesting to have a look at how these things actually work under the hood. So let's have a look. So we do have, no, those are the widgets, so that's not going to help us. Oh, maybe, oh, this is a React thing, isn't it? Ah, shit. But it has to, at some point, Visible, aha. Uh -huh. Well, but that's not, uh, I don't think that's that's helping. Toggle sidebar, no, that's not what I want to do. <laughs> okay, right, I'm not exactly sure. So let's let's Google this. Inspect A-frame, inspector without, uh, programmatically. Program, yeah? On Google, it also adjust puts a few components into the AC. Yeah. Uh, and it works without triggering any events. Aha. And A sphere inside a box. Wait. Actually, I have an idea. That's a, that's a very good one, and I think I have an idea. Actually, let me give, give me a second. Uh, view source because a coworker of mine did this button that shows it. So maybe, just maybe, how does he do the button? Ah, look at that. So basically, aha, aha, aha. So instead of, so the people who have problems with the key combination should probably be able to do the following thing. And let me zoom in. Yeah. So if you do like window.post message inject a frame inspector star, that should apparently trigger the inspector as well. I'm very sorry for that little detour. Window.post message. Window.postmessage.inject a frame inspector like this. So this is, whoopsa, where the hell do I, all right, here we go. This is like the line that you want to go for. So if, if that is the workaround you have to do because the keyboard, uh, key combination doesn't work, then that's how you, so anyone in this work, yeah, it does work. So does everyone have this wonderful dev tools open now? Yes, good. If not, let me know because now is the time to figure that one out. So the nice thing about the DevTools is they're like super handy uh, and they show something that yes, you don't, right. Uh, you needed this, I guess. Is that the one you're looking for? Does it work for you if you do that in the console? Um, you basically like, you open the DevTools and then in there you should run this command and then it should give you the, Works? Look, this thing is called bleeding edge because it you cut yourself every now and then. So this is this is like the cuts you get. Does everyone have the inspector now? Or is there like still, still someone not having the inspector open? Everyone ready? Okay, sweet. So now again, so these dev tools are built in into A-Frame and they're like super nice and they show us something that we didn't know because A-Frame is actually nice to us. So I, I said early on, if we, wanted, if we wanna think about what we're doing in, in terms of like 3D, AR, VR content in the web, 
we're basically making a movie. So we have an empty scene, and we have a camera, and we have a light, and then we have objects which are called entities in A-frame. Now, if you notice, in our HTML, we have only added an entity, but we do not have any light or any camera, right? We didn't do that. But A-frame is so nice in saying like, well, look, if you don't have a camera, you can't really have a movie. So people would be like super annoyed by the fact that they are not seeing anything. So if you do not have any light or camera, we're going to add that for you. So A-frame makes sure that we always have at least like one light and one uh, camera available. So what you see here is like this thing that looks like a bit weird, like a star with a white thing coming from it. That's the camera. So basically, we are, we are standing here and looking in that direction. And everything within these, these lines, these orange lines, is what we actually, I'm not exactly sure. Can I turn off the light in front of here? Because I think it's really hard to see, isn't it? Let's see. I don't know what's going to happen when I press on this. Nothing. That's awesome. Nope. Nope. I have no idea. Oh, look at that. Here we go. Magically, it did the thing. Probably running Java. That's why the delay comes to be. Anyway. Um, so you, you see like everything in this box that looks like in this direction is visible. Everything else is outside of our field of view. And that kind of mimics how humans like see. We have this like field of vision and we're seeing like everything that is around here. But if I put something here or under me, I'm not actually seeing it. So we, what we have here is everything, unless I give it an explicit position, is at zero, 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 except for the camera, which is at uh, one meter sixty in the air. And that's because it goes like, well, OK, in this case, I have no information how, how tall the user is. I don't know how tall you are until you tell me, right? So I'm assuming an adult is probably like the average adult is like 1 meter 60. So if I put your eye level on 1 meter 60, it kind of looks like natural. So it automatically moves the camera up to 1 meter 60 above the ground. Our box is at 0, 0, 0. By the way, notice that the position that something is is always the center of it. Well, not always, but in this case, it is in the center. So the center point here in this box, in the middle of the box, is at 0, 0, 0. The box is below us. We're not seeing it because we're on top of the box. Uh, also, this white thing here, that's a light. That's a light shining from this direction. And you can see that it's slightly brighter here than here. And that's because the light's coming from this direction. OK. So we're not seeing anything right now because we are on top of the box. But that means that if I use, and again, A-Frame gives us this for free, if I drag with my mouse, uh, I should be, whoa, why is it not showing? OK, whatever. Um, yeah, this is the day. Oh, I'm looking upwards now. That was very smart, Martin. Here we go. There it is, right below us. You can use WASD to actually move around as well. This is also like an, a default from A-Frame, so it gives you a reasonable default that you can move around and then you see like the box here. Okay, cool, nice. But if I reload, I have the same problem. I'm standing on top of it. I'm not seeing anything, right? So, so what's nice is in, the, in this developer tools, it's not just like a way to actually look into the scene, but it also gives us a little bit of power. So what happens if I click on the box? You see that now that I clicked on the box, a few things appear. First things first, there's like this blue box around the box. This is called the bounding box. And then you have like this, this bunch of things here, right? So what happens when I press on this? Oh, look at that. I can move it around. Surprise, surprise. What happens if I, if I press this? Oh, I can move it around. So we basically like, get a few controls that allow us to move the box around. And if I go back to scene, the box is now at the position where I put it. This is not the only thing that we can do. So if you look here, up here, you see like there is, uh, there's a few things up here. Right now, in blue is this one, and that's because we are in the moving mode. So we can move objects around like this. But if we click here, we get a different cursor. We get this like weird lines around the object. So now what we can do is we can rotate it around. And you see that the box is merely there to show us like where's the, where's the maximum distance from the, from the middle point of this thing. So basically, like, this is called a bounding box because it always uh, surrounds the object as tightly as it can. Sorry, could you repeat how you got there? Right. Let me move, zoom out again. So here we are at this moment, right? So in the, uh, like, wait, you have the uh, inspector open, right? Yeah. Yes. So up here in the inspector, ding, 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 yeah. there, and I'm, I'm zooming in again. We have these three buttons, and it allows you to switch to rotation, and it also allows you to scale. So you can also go, and if I zoom, ah, if I zoom out again, 
you now have different controls again. Yes. Like, you don't get the inspector. Yeah, no, the scene itself. Wait, um, did you join us later or something? Or yeah, does this... Right, okay. So does the scene look like this right now? Yeah, I have this. Do you have removed the class hidden from AC? Because it was like this before. Uh, yeah. And I think there's a CSS that actually then hides the scene. Okay. So if you remove that, you should see the scene again. And well, now I, I undid all my changes. So I'm just going to quickly move things again, like here. And then I rotate this a little bit. And now I can also scale it up in all directions. So I can scale it like here, and here, and here, or maybe not. Oops. Uh. Maybe not like that. Oh, ah, OK, that was not the smartest plan I had um, to like scale it like weirdly. Here we go. And then you have like the scene as you presented it. So this is a very visual way of creating these scenes. And this is convenient because it gives you other possibilities as well. So first things first, you can also see the position, rotation, and scale up here. So if you, in the upper right-hand corner, you have the current object that is selected. You have the information of position, rotation, and scale here as well, along the three axes. I think we haven't talked about the axis system uh, for, for this moment. So let's actually try that out. So first axis is the x-axis. This is how far to the left and to the right it is in meters. So 1 means it's 1 meter to the left, uh, sorry, to the right. Minus 1 means 1 meter to the left from the from the middle, which is like this line here. So I can move that around like this, uh, or I can put it like, like minus two meters, and then it's going to be here. I can also just enter the scale here, and then it's going to scale along the same three axes. The rotation is sometimes a bit confusing, but if you think about rotating around an axis, you can, like, or I remember it like this. So we have the three axes. We have the x-axis like this, we have the y-axis like this, and we have the z-axis negative values go, uh, sorry, go into the screen, positive values go towards the screen. So if we want to think about how rotation works and we rotate around an axis, if I rotate around the y-axis, so this is my axis that I rotate around, basically I, I put like a skewer through me and then rotate like that, right? If I rotate around the x-axis, what's going to happen? Correct, like this. If I rotate around the z-axis, I'm going to do like this weird wonky movement. So this is how rotation uh, works in the three axes. And the axes are kind of like always the same. So they follow the object. Wonderful. What's the rotation order? The rotation order, as far as I'm aware, is y, x, z. But I might be wrong. It might be x, y, z. Luckily, that is normally hidden behind the <coughs> interface. So yes, OK, cool, great. Um, there's also some, some more stuff down here on the right-hand side. So what is there, for instance, is the, actually, I'm going to just generally zoom in the page, I think. Um, what we also have here is like if it's visible or not. So we can hide this object entirely by just clicking on it. Uh, you can also do the same thing here. So that's like a shortcut. You also see all the objects in the scene on the left-hand side, but we're going to look into that in a second. Um, but we also see all the components individually listed here. So this, this box, this entity here, has like a box geometry. So like there's a geometry with a primitive box. Nice. And it has a material that has a color of red. Nice. So basically, all these informations, all the components, are always going to be listed here. So what we can do is we can also change things in here, which is like super nice. So for instance, like a box is nice and fine. Um, and I'm probably going to reset like the, the orientation and the scale. And I'm going to put it at like 0, 0, minus 2. So I put it minus 2 meters, uh, sorry, yeah, 2 meters into the screen so that it's like in front of me. Actually, let's put that into code. How do we do that? Again, position is a special kind of component, but it's a component. Um, and it takes a position in x, y, z. So they say like nothing to the no meters to the left or to the right, no meters to up or down, and minus two meters. So like minus two meters out of the screen or two meters into the screen. Uh, the box by default is one meter by one meter, so it's going to be well in in the screen right now. So if we reload, we see it like down here, 
And the fact that we have to look down on it is because we are 1 meter 60 high, right? Our eyes are not on the ground. So you could also, if you want to, let's, let's do that. Let's, it looks a bit more boring, but let's do that. We couldn't put it on 1 meter 60 uh, y, x, um, y, and then we have it like on eye level. So this box is now on eye level. Wonderful. But what we can do when we select the box and go into the geometry component, we can change the primitive. So for instance, we can use a cylinder, or we can use a dodecahedron, whatever. Um, we can use pretty much everything that 3JS comes with, and there's a bunch of them. A sphere, a torus, yeah, let's have a donut. Uh, a torus knot, which is like the least useful thing ever, but it looks kind of fancy. So here we go, yeah. It's the pretzel of 3D, or the pile of poo, it depends a little bit on the perspective. So we can do that. And we can do that for all the components. So basically, we can change like the, the, like the parameters here, um, which for the torus knot are not very intuitive. For the material, it's a little easier. So I can, for instance, click on the color in the material component and say, I don't like red. I want this to be bluish, like this. And maybe I want this to be, I don't know, uh, like super shiny, so let's set that to like one. And then you get like this super shiny torus knot in blue. Um, or maybe you want the wireframe, uh, you know, optics. So now this looks more like the, I don't know, 90s things that you would see on screen. Um, nice, that's pretty good. So you can basically control everything in here. But now the problem is if I reload, I lose all of that, right? And I don't want to type everything out that I changed down here, so that's like super annoying. So I have a bunch of possibilities to make that easier for me. One possibility is I can just copy the attributes of one individual component if I only made changes to one of them. But I didn't, I actually changed the entire component, like where it's positioned and everything, I can change that like this. Uh, maybe I want to move it over here. And then there's this button over here that allows me to either download the thing as, an, as a file or just copy it to clipboard. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm copy this to clipboard. <coughs> and uh, if I now go back into my code and say, OK, I want to put this in here, then you see like it puts all the things. It's quite a bit, but it's, it puts all the things into our code. I'm going to make this a little more readable by putting these uh, below each other so that it's nicer to actually read this. But this is nice because I no longer have to like remember these values. I can just copy this around. Um, and let's say if I, if I change just the material because I don't want this to be a wireframe anymore, I can open the inspector again, click on the object, uh, go to material and say wireframe no, and then go back up and say copy attribute. Oops, that was the wrong one. Copy attributes and put just the attributes in here. So basically, I kind of go like, no, I don't want this. I want, oops. Uh. The, the problem with this is it basically like copies the entire thing, which is a bit of a bug, but OK, let's, let's not get into that. So mine hasn't got a deep copy. I've got um, offset, like so the material. Offset is object. Yes, that, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like copying everything is usually not the best idea because it has exactly this problem. Because under the hood, so this is an interesting thing. For performance reasons, under the hood, um, A-Frame uses objects in the attributes. So it overrides the set attribute and get attribute methods. But obviously, the DOM only supports like strings. So it has to like wrap between the two. So sometimes this leads to a bit of confusion between what the DOM needs to see and what A-Frame sees. But normally, that's not a bigger, bigger, blah, not a bigger problem. But like, um, actually, material is like the worst thing because it has so many objects uh, in its properties. Anyway, cool. So now we have like our two objects here, and we have we know how to like copy it to and from. But it's kind of boring, isn't it? Like we have how what how many primitives do we have? We have like ten, twelve, maybe I don't know. Let's see, like one. Actually, let's start from from the top. Actually, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, I don't know. It doesn't scroll anymore. That's nice. Um, it's like maybe like 12 or something like that, or maybe 20. Who knows? But it's not that terribly exciting. So let's, let's add some more interesting things. For instance, if you want to have a background color, because right now this is white because the page is white. And if we would go into the page 
uh, with, oops, uh, that was the wrong keyboard combination. Control, Shift, I, well, whatever. If I, ah, uh, give me my freaking dev tools, come on. If I would go to the body and give it a background color of, let's say, uh, background green, then this is, this is not nice. This is actually convenient for AR because basically the scene is transparent, so it takes whatever color is behind it. So if we would have to have a, uh, an AR application, we would take the camera picture and just put it in the background. Um, but this is not quite what we want, right? I, I don't want the page behind to dictate what I'm going to see. So what we do instead is we create a new entity. Um, sky. And I think there's, I think sky blue is supported. Let's see if it is. No, it's not. Great. Oh, no, be, ah, I'm, I'm doing this mistake. I keep making this mistake. So material color, sky blue, and I think sky blue is supported. So sky itself is a property, <coughs> not a... Um, Should be. Well, you know what? I'm actually not sure, but I'm not using the sky that often. So there's actually a thing that I try to not show you, but let's, let's do it anyways. There's usually a direct variation of these components that is used like this. So you can do a sky as well, and then you can do actually like sky blue. And I'm pretty sure that I should be getting the sky blue background. Yes, now I do. So you can do that. Uh, and what it does is it puts a really, really, really large sphere around us, a gigantic sphere, like the sky would be uh, a sphere around the Earth, which is obviously not true, but you know, there's like hollow Earth people that think that's the true thing, but let's not talk about them too much. So we can give this a, a color, and that's nice. So yes, that's a good start. But we can also put an image onto this. Now, it might not make sense to put any image because what we really want to do is we want to put a 360 degree image. So let me actually, I have a, I might have to take, uh, turn on the lights again. I have a little 360 degree camera with me that uh, is the Ricoh Theta S. And I hope that it's charged because I charged it yesterday, but I'm never sure if the if the outlet, because my adapter is a little wonky and, uh, you know, long story short is shit. Um, <laughs> so let's turn on the light. Ah, Java has had a hot cache. And <laughs> it's pretty good. So this thing requires me to connect my phone to this particular Wi-Fi that it's spawning. Just don't get me started. And here we go. And then I can take the app. Connected, no internet. No, really, my phone, my camera does not have internet? How dare is it? So let's see. It's going to look like super weird because my hands are going to look like gigantic probably, but that's going to be fine. So say cheese. That was it. It's super exciting, isn't it? Um, so I get a 360 degree picture from us, which is nice. Transferring, then I have to upload it to the cloud to download it to my computer. <laughs> share it with everyone because that's how technology works in 2018. Um, isn't it exciting? Not really. So let's, let's connect to the actual Wi-Fi that we want to use here. Shangri-La, come on. What? No, don't forget the Wi-Fi. Connect to the Wi-Fi, you bastard. Okay, it seems to be connected. Does the thing do the thing that I want it to do? Let's see if it's uploaded in my photos already. Let's go up here. Yeah, it has already uploaded to the cloud. That's amazing. So I'll quickly go to my other browser and go to photos. I hope that I don't have any incriminating photos anywhere near here. And here we have like this gigantic image and I'm going to download it and show you how it looks like um, by itself. So this is, the, uh, this is how the image looks like. And it looks a bit weird. You see like, it's like stretched here and it's like stretched there. And my hand looks like I have the, an arm of like 10 meters length or something. So yeah, let's, let's put that on uh, glitch, which is, where's my other window here? So I can upload it and then I can share the link with you all. Uh, let me get computer, and this is the image that I just took. It's going to be a super long URL, so what I'm going to do is 
Listen carefully now because I had so many problems with what's going to happen in a second. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put the link in a link shortener. However, that link shortener does not work as a source for the texture. So what you want to do is you want to click on the short link that I'm going to share with you, take the long URL and copy that into your A-frame scene. Again, if you use the short URL into, in your A-frame scene, it's not going to work. I'm just going to use it so that we have a better experience than using the gigantic URL that this is going to give me, unless you want to type that out. Um, so let's go to like, I don't know, uh, you know, goo.gl. I, I don't think they need a re registration. I'm not a robot. Go away. Good. Thank you. Here we go. So this is the URL that you want to want to copy over. Um, let me actually, you know, that. So this is the one. You do not put that into your A-frame scene. You click on that link or put that link into your address bar and you get the longer version back. And the long link is what we need. The long URL is what you want to copy. Very important. Uh, excuse me. Can yes. Uh, sure. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, of course I can do that. There we go. All right, all done? Yep. Everyone got the, the terrible long URL that we are looking for? Wonderful. So the terrible long URL, and I'm just going to check if it actually does. Yeah, it automatically replaces with the long URL. So what we do is um, I don't need that anymore because I want to be back in my HTML. So instead of saying color, what we can do is we can give it a source, SRC, like an image would get a source. And we can copy in or paste in that long URL. And then, so basically, a sky source src equals, and then this long URL, we're going to get this. And we can turn around and hi, everyone. How are you all doing? Yeah, I can't wave back in VR just yet. But all right, so yes. And you can do that with pretty much any of these pictures. These pictures are called equirectangular pictures because basically what you're doing is you take a 360-degree sphere and you unroll that onto basically you take like, you have to imagine like wrapping a balloon in a piece of paper and then rolling that down to like the, the plain piece of paper again. So um, as this, the sky is a gigantic sphere and this picture was a gigantic sphere, it lines up perfectly. It's just, we just have to put it on as a texture and it looks like the right thing. And um, by the way, if you were wondering like, this is a VR workshop, why are we not doing VR? Why are we typing things into our computer and looking at our computer? The reason for that is, A, uh, it's really hard to get enough um, uh, devices, like we have a few to try out in a, in a moment. Um, but also, it's like super inconvenient to debug most of the times because you like have to put it into like a USB and then you have to get like the remote debugger working and all that kind of stuff and then you're like, oh shit, this is not looking right. So it is it is better than with like Unity or any on any of these because you don't have to like compile anything beforehand, but it's still like a little un uneasy. And the good thing is A frame is responsive. So you see like there's this little button down here, but I don't have a VR headset right now, right? So if I click that, it just goes into full screen mode. Nice. Uh, if I would have a device that has a like a phone, if I would have a, uh, have do, done it on the phone, it would automatically figure out like, oh, I can do VR with this, and basically like show you an actual VR picture and, and use the actual device orientation to look around. So like it is responsive to the device that you're on. So basically, all you're seeing here in non-VR, you can try out later in VR with no additional magic. And that's the beauty of it, right? And it, and it works on like HTC Vive, it works on Oculus Rift, it works on Cardboard, it works on Gear VR, it works on uh, Daydream, it works on um, uh, Windows Mixed Reality headsets, not the HoloLens though. Uh, I'm working on that with Microsoft, it's going to be an interesting journey. Um, so yeah, basically all the, all the VR headsets that are out there on the market do support, or most of them support WebVR and uh, A-Frame just works with them without having to do like any magic. So basically we are 
settled. When we when we got 3D right on the screen, we, we are done for VR as well. And we, we're gonna explore that in a bit. Like I have a few headsets here that you can try with your phones. Okay. Right, so this this is nice as well. So cool, yeah, we have a 360 degree picture. But you see, like if I'm if I'm now I'm moving around with WASD, but it doesn't look like I'm moving around, and that's because the sky is gigantic, right? So like you see that I'm actually moving around, but the picture in the background does not move. And the reason for that is that the sky is like, I don't actually know how large, it's probably like 10,000 meters or something, in, or maybe 1,000 meters in, in size. So if you think about it, if you would be walking on a field and there's like a tree a kilometer away and you walk toward it, it's not going to be like, oh my God, the tree is going to move so much because that's the parallax that we get in our perception that things that are farther away are not moving as much as things that are closer by. So that's why this is actually like motion is working in it, but you're not really seeing it because the sky is so huge. But, you know, let's, let's try some more interesting uh, 3D objects. So how can we get 3D objects? Well, you have to become a 3D artist. No, just kidding. Um, you, sh you should though, because it's like a super interesting experience and I can highly recommend it. And it's not as hard as it looks, to be honest. It's like, it's not too complicated. Um, but we're gonna do it easier. We're gonna get our scripts back. So uh, I suggest that actually, no, you know what? We're gonna start with the first script first. So this is like a shameless plug because um, this is what the company I work for, Archaeologic, builds this thing. We're, it's a platform that we build for you to build uh, VR, AR, and 3D applications for architecture and uh, interior design. And what we are trying to do is make your life easier. And we started our journey with an experiment. And we're going to show you in a second what that experiment is going to look like. So here's my scene. Nothing has changed. Nothing new has a appeared, except what happens if I open the inspector? Do you notice a difference? Probably not because it's like super subtle because we're not like marketing dicks. Um, so up here in the sidebar, there's a new button that hasn't been there before. It's the 3D.io button. And we did that to make your life a little easier. So what I can do is I can click on it and I get this wonderful little menu here. And aha, this is interesting. There's a bunch of stuff. One of them being poly.google.com. So Google has built a few applications uh, that allow you to create 3D content really easily in VR. <coughs> One of them is Tilt Brush. Actually, Tilt Brush costs money now, so I'm not that happy about it. But um, it's like $20 or something. But it's really worth it because basically what it is, it's like paint but in 3D space. So you get like a, a, a brush and then you can just start like painting. And you can paint with fire and water and stuff. I mean, you can paint with fire at home once, maybe? <laughs> but in VR, it's a lot safer, so that's like nice. Um, and then you can export that to like their platform, which is called Poly. And there's also another thing that's called Google Blocks. And it's like basically like you're in VR, and you have a bunch of primitive shapes like spheres and boxes. And basically what if A-Frame has is, is primitives as well. And you just like put them here, and then you drag them up, and then you remove bits and pieces, and then you color them in, and hey, you have a car or a house or whatever. So we can like look for something like um, pff, horse. So this is stuff that people created. Wow, OK, this is underwhelming. Um, let's try tree. OK, better, but still not good. And here we're actually going to see like one of the biggest problems with these objects. Um, so if we click on this tree, for instance, so I'm, I'm taking like the first one that I get here, tree by, and I'm unfortunate, whoops. OK, hi, projector. How are you doing? <laughs> um, I'm clicking on the first tree that I got. And it's going to say, like, loading. And it's going to load. And hey, here's a tree. Do you see the tree? It is tiny as fuck. <laughs> and, uh, and that's exactly my problem with this kind of stuff. It's like, where is my, OK, I have, like, this is a tree? Come on. And it gets better. So I'm not blaming the author. The problem is like 3D modeling is actually hard. And we see why it's hard here. So first things first, you might see a, a weird, what the hell is going on with the projector? Uh, you might want to see, you might see a, a thing that is like a little odd, uh, which is like, I'm here on the object, but the, the cursor is here. Ha, huh. what the heck has happened? So now I'm, I might go like, oh, this is not a problem. I can make the tree larger. So let's, let's try scaling up the tree. So let's say like two, 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 double the size. Hmm. 
Did that actually scale it up? I don't think so. Let's try like four. Four, four, eight. what the hell is going on? Okay, now it's not actually, ah, oh, because I'm scaling the light. Okay, that was fun. Um, so let's try like, okay, still, we have a bit of a problem here because you see like, the cursor is not where the action, am I, am, I, am I killing the projector with like a too high of a resolution or something? Let's, let's scale to whatever it says it has. Hopefully that's gonna fix the graphics problems. Uh, okay, anyway. Um, so like you see the cursor is not where the actual tree is and if I now start scaling it up, just watch, just watch where the, the, the thing is. Two, two, two. Goodbye tree. Has been a fun ride. Bye. And why is that? Like what the hell is happening? Is this a problem with A-frame? Uh, no. The problem, oh, this is so weird to have yourself in the background. Okay, whatever. Um, no, this is not a problem coming from A-frame. This is actually a problem with the 3D models. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of 3D artists don't know this either. So a lot of 3D artists come from a background where you're making it look nice when you render an image. So they're like, yeah, and I have this object here, and it looks perfect from my camera, and it's, oh, it's great. And I just put it on the internet, and people can download it and then have fun with it. Um, but there's a few things that they don't know. They simply don't know because no one tells them and we are actually fixing that right now by having like a guide for 3D artists to, to not make these mistakes. And one of them is the origin of the 3D program should be the origin, like the middle of your object. If you're not doing that, then you have the, the weirdest problems. Just imagine it like this. Let me, let me show you something. So if I take this water bottle and I model it in a 3D program, then I have a coordinate system in the 3D program and I have a coordinate system in A-frame, for instance. So we could start with like, if I'm, now let's say I'm a smart 3D artist and I put my, my 0, 0, 0 is right in the middle of the bottle, right, right in the middle, I can't actually like put my finger, actually I can put my finger in. It's right, it's right here. Uh, oh, that was inappropriate. Um, <laughs> anyway, so like my, my bottle is right here. So now if I, if I uh, rotate it, I'm gonna rotate it around this point and everything will be exactly as I expected. But what happens if my zero, zero, zero is here and my bottle is here? What do you think happens? That's the right gesture. So I'm still rotating around this point, but now my bottle in my scene goes, whee! And you're like, no, that was, no, that was not exactly what I wanted to do. And scaling has the same problem. When you scale, all the math is wrong, and then it scales like in a different direction. And you're like, no? This should not have happened, so it should always be like in the middle uh, at zero, zero, zero in your 3D editing program, and you should also take care of the scaling. Poly and um, uh, taint brush, uh, tilt brush, and um, what's the other thing called? Blocks do not give you a hint on the scale. So the problem is like 3D programs use units, and units mean whatever you think they mean. Now, 99% of the people on the world say one unit is one meter because it's an easier system to work with than like uh, inches and feet and stuff. But some people just don't care because when you render something, I'm actually going to show you something real quick. Uh, I just want to, because I basically just recently learned 3D modeling from a coworker of mine and I made all the mistakes myself. Um, so I can show you what's, what's wrong with people making 3D models. And it's not like, I'm not blaming them because the, the tools are just not helping. So let's say I want to create something. This is Blender. This is one of the 3D editing softwares, but you don't have to install it. Uh, I just wanted to show you something real quick. So I can create a cube. Cool. Now, can you tell me how large this cube is? One by one by one. Mm -hmm. Whatever. One by one by one what? Whatever. Whatever. That's correct. And the thing is, like, I don't even... I honestly, like Blender is a magical tool of wonder that can do all the things and the interface is really powerful because you can do things like this. And I'm like, what? Um, so it's like, it's actually, it's not that hard to work with Blender, surprisingly, even though it, it might look like that. Uh, it's actually not that, that dangerous or, or tricky to work with it. It's actually kind of nice. But the problem is you have no indication of what the units are. So you have to like, in the, somewhere in the settings, it's actually well hidden and I'm, Honestly, I'm not sure if I'm going to find it today. So let's see. Um, yeah. So. Hi. Hi. How are you? Pretty good, and you? Good morning. Hello. How's everybody? Hi. Are you okay? Um, yeah. Where did they find this pre-war projector? <laughs> <laughs> I 
Um, I hope everything is okay. Everything's fine. Nice. Uh, so I'm just here to say good morning. Welcome to good morning. day number two. I hope you're enjoying yourself so far. Um, so? A few announcements. I mean, if they are not yet, they're going to be snacks soon between 10 and 11. I think they brought some in back there somewhere. Yeah. Right, perfect. Uh, we also have, whenever he allows you to do that, you can join us at the Hacker Deck. <laughs> or, you know, we have nitro coffee there. I'm not holding you hostage. <laughs> Just <laughs> FYI. Um, we have nitro coffee there, uh, which is really nice. And we have a cocktail robot there. The cocktail robot likes QR codes, and we posted one of them already on uh, Twitter and Facebook. So if you're not following us yet, JSConfAsia is the handle. Um, get the QR code, hold it in front of the robot, and it will make you a cocktail. Mocktails for now. I think <laughs> that seems a bit early. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna really uh, enable the cocktails too. So that is about it. Uh, would you mind standing there and I take a picture? Oh. <laughs> Damn it! All this, all this. Yeah, exactly. You you missed our 360 degree picture. Oh. It's like a bit further to the left. Oh god. Yeah, perfect. That's what you want. <laughs> ah. I love it. Freaking photo ops. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah, like seriously, I'm not holding you hostage, so if you, you know, want to have a coffee, go ahead. Uh, as I'm kind of like digressing anyways. So yeah, you see like the problem is if, if I would do this, um, and I might even like, like put it somewhere here, and then move my camera somewhere, and then like start rendering it like this, and I'm like, yeah, no, this looks good, this is exactly how I want it. But if I then export this to, um, to a 3D file, then it's all wrong because you can you can tell if I go to the top level view that if I would now rotate it in A-frame, this being my zero zero zero, it would like do this entire like bananas crazy movement around a sun that doesn't exist, and uh, and that's like really really hard to get right. Um, so yet yeah, bear that in mind when you download things from the internet. Learn at least the minimum blender you need to actually fix models. So like let's say like. Um, I'm actually going to show you this just real quick because it's not that hard. So let's say we, we downloaded this wonderful model and it's not in the right position. What you definitely want to do is you want to put your camera on the top and probably disable perspective so that's a little easier. And then you can use G like grab and then move it to the center like this. Obviously, that's not always that easy. There's actually a better way. Actually, I made a video with a coworker of mine. I'm probably going to share the link on my Twitter account later on um, because we explain this in much, much more detail. And then you would go like to the front, and you see like it's too far up. So I actually got now gonna gonna move it down. And now this is this is nicer to work with for artists uh, or sorry for for programmers. But anyway, um, there's a video that explains it. Now that I think about it, let's ignore that. But basically what we want to do is we want to have like models that have the right scale so we don't have to scale them up, we have, that have the right rotation so we don't have to rotate them that much, and that are centered around the origin so that we don't have these weird behaviors. So poly is not the best source for this, unfortunately. And now, by the way, we're doing a little trick here. So you see like all the objects in the scene are on the left-hand side, so we can click the little trash can icon and off we go. Goodbye, little tree. Can we reset the center point within iframe? Um, not that easily. It is possible. It's just like a lot of gymnastics, and uh, it is just easier to fix it. And it's not worth it. Um, we also have like other things in in uh, in our wonderful little plugin. So here we have the furniture library and the staff picks. Um, staff picks are basically we have a service, uh, and it's it's for free actually. Um, we have a service that allows you to to get a three D model from a floor plan. Um, obviously, we're not going to show everyone's floor plans here, but we have like a few 3D models that we created. For instance, like the Big Bang Theory apartment, and you can just drag and drop it in, and boom, here you have it. Um, and if I now go back to the scene, I am standing in... Okay, this is weird. Let's go inside. Whoops. Where am I right now? Oh, there's a gigantic thing in here. <laughs> yeah, talk about scale, right? Hi. So this is, this is to scale, this is uh, Sheldon's spot and stuff like that. So um, this is scaled correctly and it is normally aligned to the axis and it is nice to work with and then you can just, just drag and drop things in and, and export them um, like the other things. Let me actually remove like some of my stuff here because it's like super annoying. Uh, let's get rid of the sky as well and let's get rid of the 
box two. Goodbye box. So what we can do then is we can click here. Uh, you can click on the little duplicate here to make it appear more than once. Or what we can also do is on over here on the right hand side, outside of what the projector shows. So it's amazing. Let's see, pop. So we can copy this again, copy, go into our editor, go away. Uh, go into our editor. I'm going to remove the sky here as well, and I'm going to remove these two primitives as well. And then if I paste this, I get like, oops, uh, I get the A entity. And now if we are coming back here, then we are back in the, in the uh, apartment of Big Bang Theory. Um, that same thing works with the furniture library. So if you only need a single piece of furniture, so let me remove this gigantic piece of of architecture and just like load one piece of furniture. Let's say like I want this sofa. Um, I can select the sofa. I'm, I like this sofa a lot, so I'm going to pick it. And these are actually real furniture pieces. And you can tell like the, the scale makes sense. We could sit down on this one. And if I put like, I don't know, do we have plants? I don't, I don't know. I've never tried this. Let's see what happens. Ha! Huh, we do have plants. That's nice. A little greenery. And you see that like the bounding box fits correctly and the, uh, the cursor is at the right position. And I can just like drag and drop things next to it. And they look like they are reasonably sized. If you think about a sofa, this like little palm tree. Why would you put like such a tree in or whatever? Like this looks reasonable. And you can import them really easily into your A-frame scene. So that's nice. But you can also do other things. So like um, what I like to do is like 3D free 3D model gives you a bunch of 3D warehouses they are called. Sometimes you can also pay the like please, please, please. If you see a nice 3D model, just pay the artist. It's worth it. Mm, but there's a bunch of free stuff available as well. But what you want to do is um, consider performance. Performance is always a bit of a problem uh, when you have lots of objects. So you want to probably try the low poly things if possible. And like, how do I put this? Depending on what you want to do as a 3D artist, um, you can take a different amount of triangles for the same object. Let's say like a chair. A chair is not that complicated normally, and you can do a lot of things with like ticks, with like tricks that uh, 3D artists might use to make it look really nice. So you can use, let's say, a thousand triangles for a chair, uh, chair, or you can use a hundred thousand triangles for a chair. And if you consider like two hundred thousand triangles being like the maximum that is reasonable to put in a scene, like into your entire world, then a chair with 100,000 triangles is like half of everything you've got for your entire world. That's not necessarily a good idea. So you want to try to find like the polygon count to be as, mini as, as, like as low as possible while still looking great. And low polygons does not necessarily mean like it looks terrible. For instance, this, this horse is actually relatively low on polygons, but it looks pretty great. How many polygons does it actually have? Let's see, polygons 4,200. So that's like not too bad. It's not too great either, but it's not too bad either. So you want to find the ones that are actually making sense. Or you create your own ones. That's also a possibility. Nothing's impossible. Cool. So we can do that and we can like use a bunch of these models and we can combine them as well. So let me go back to the staff picks. There's a model that I particularly like. Uh, which is this one, it's like called the Stahlhaus. Uh, it's a famous building, I think, in LA. Maybe I should not put it where, like, the couch is now in the pool. So I might want to reconsider that. So we can go in here and I can remove these ones because, you know, the plants are nice, but if they are standing in the pool, I don't know. I don't feel confident about that. Um, and I can now go and and copy that one into our A-frame scene as well. So I'm going to remove the original one that I put in and put in the Stahlhaus instead. Let's do that. And uh, here we go. Now we have the Stahlhaus. Maybe put like a sky around again so that we have a nicer looking surrounding. So I do like A, sky, color, sky, blue. 
Yeah, that's looking a little better. Um, not exactly sure why we're not... Oh, because it's one of the things where we do like a, a look into, so this one does not have a, have a roof. Okay, well, it's a bit weird to not have a roof, but let's, let's not go into that detail right now. And we can walk on the water, that's also nice. So importing 3D models is not as complicated. But what if you don't want to use one of our 3D models? Well, that is absolutely fine. In which case, you probably want to import a 3D model. Uh, let me actually see. So Glitch is a bit particular about paths, which is not making it easier. Um, but I'm going to quickly do something for you. So imagine that I find a Blender file online, which I conveniently did. Uh, because it's the exact same model. Um, what I can then do is I can take this and import, export it into a format that makes sense. And to be honest, there's like a lot of different 3D formats. And I highly recommend you to use uh, what is called the GLTF format. I'm going to explain a little bit why that matters in a second. So let's... No, actually, I do want to export all of this. I do not want to export the camera. I do not want to export animations because we're not having animations in here. So let me export this into GLTF. Yeah. Bless you. So GLTF is basically just like a format for 3D data. Um, it's like the JPEG for 3D if you want. It's a format specifically optimized for using on the web. And I'm going to show you what other formats exist. So like one of the one of the other very popular formats is uh, OBJ. OBJ is like a super old format um, that is basically supported by every 3D software in the market. So you oftentimes find OBJs, uh, but they have a huge disadvantage. Now let's have a look. So this is, this is one of these OBJ files. Let's have a look inside how it looks like. Aha! So this file is actually a text file, basically. And if we look at it closely, and I'm going to zoom in a lot, if my browser still like, OK, Blender is in the background still exporting, so that, that's going to eat up a lot of power. So we see like a lot of numbers here. Do you have any idea what these numbers might mean? Points. Correct, those are points. In 3D, you're oftentimes not calling them points, you're calling them vertices. And three vertices usually form one triangle. Uh, which is also called a face. So here we have like lots of points and lots more points and even more points and blah, blah, blah. And then down there somewhere you have like VT. Those are texture coordinates. Uh, I'm going to explain that in a little later. Or UV coordinates called them as well. Depends a little bit. And then we have like uh, faces which are connecting these points to triangles and then you know maybe we have groups and stuff so you see like it's a really really long file um, and that's for 787 polygons 102 triangles it has 3000 lines and it has a size of it has the size somewhere doesn't it no it does not show the size where does it show does it do it here because somewhere github shows the size right it's a few megabytes actually yeah no actually no it's not that large this one, this one is relatively small it's like 86 kilobyte but it's 86 kilobyte for 100 triangles that's not very good right um and there's like no material information here that's in a second file it's the mtl file and that looks more or less like this. You have like a material with a bunch of like color numbers here and then it references the images. So it's like you have to do a lot of text parsing and you have to get all this text over the wire. So it's not very efficient, right? Because if you think about this, let's think about uh, the, the data that is in here for a second. So we basically have a bunch of points in here and they are like three comma values. So comma values are usually, um, or floating point values are usually saved as 32-bit values. So 32-bit is 4 byte. So we have three of them, x, y, and z. So we have 3 times 4 byte makes 12 bytes for one coordinate, for one vertex, right? But if you look at it, here each of these characters is a byte. So they're like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So this much space is what it would you normally take to store one of these coordinates. So we are wasting a lot of space. And even worse, we are wasting a lot of processing power because we have to read this line by line, 
break it up into smaller bits and then parse that into floats and then put that into the memory for the, for the 3D engine to pick it up. So like a lot of CPU power needed to actually parse this into a 3D model. And you can imagine that on mobile, doing that with like a two megabyte file of this format is not gonna be great. So that's why there's other formats available like GLTF, which is a JSON based file format, but it can also be binary um, and then it like saves a lot of space. So that's actually, you know what, let's, let's op, uh, export this into OBJ as well, just to get a comparison. So I'm gonna export this into OBJ and we're gonna do that like, export, da 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 da. Okay, and now let's have a look at the files. Um, this is not the right folder, this is the right folder. So here we have like the GLTF file, uh, complete, com completely com including everything, all the images is quite large, it's 150 megabytes. The OBJ is like 16 megabytes. But what happens if I'm not including all the materials, all the files? Let's see, there must be an, uh, where is it actually? Here, here it is, Stahlhaus J, uh, GLTF, let's have a look, get info. So this one is like 400 kilobytes, 448 kilobytes versus 16.2 megabytes. Hmm. And I can get that as a single file version, which is nice. It's quite large, but it contains all the images. And the reason why I did that is because unfortunately Glitch is not making it easy to upload things that are referencing other things. Because normally what you would do is you would use browser caching. So you would have like a GLTF file referencing all the images because then if like the model changes and one image changes, you would only download that one image and the, the JSON file which is like 400 kilobytes um, and you would not download all the, the, the textures again. But Unfortunately, Glitch has a problem with like linking to other things, so we only have to upload one file to make that work. And uh, that unfortunately means that I'm in the wrong folder here, I believe. Is that the right folder? Yes, that looks like the right folder. Uh, let's see how that goes. We are uploading 150 megabytes. That's going to be... F Ooh. Ah, okay, no, that, that looks more like it. I was like, oh, look at that, it's half done. How does that work? Yeah, never mind. Oh, boy. I think it's time for a coffee break. <laughs> um, but basically how we, how we can use these uh, GLTF files. Oh, Jesus. This is gonna be painful. Uh, conveniently, it's like the same thing. Uh, uh, A-Frame comes with a, can I actually? Yes, I can, that's lovely. Comes with a component for GLTF models. So what we can do is we can say like A-Entity, GLTF model, and then just give it a URL to the GLTF model. So now we don't have it, but so I'm basically gonna do like, to be found out dot gltf. So basically we put in the gltf file name here and then it loads the gltf automatically. It's actually faster than I would have expected. So that's pretty good. And then we would basically get the same model. So it's a bit of pointless, but you, you can use uh, gltf models like this, which is nice. Okay, now we have 3D models in here. And uh, we have experimented a little bit, but let's let's do something more interesting. Let's add something that is moving and you know something more in interesting uh, into this. So let's say I do my geometry primitive box material. Oops, ah, color red, and I position. Nope, 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 nope. Position it zero zero minus two. And I'm removing this as well because we don't really need that. Oh, do I have the URL now? Oh, that's convenient. Let's, let's try if that works. GLTF model. And uh, right. I honestly have never tried what happens when you export it as a single file. So I'm looking forward to find out what happens when you export it as a single file. That's what I thought. It doesn't complain, so it's probably still loading it. Who knows, let's try that out. Yeah, that might take a while. And that's precisely why you don't do single. This is an important lesson learned, by the way. Like, do not use the single file option because it's just like not worth it uh, as it like blocks the rendering until it actually comes back from the network. Okay, I'll leave that in though. Um, Actually, no, I, I won't because I'm going to use it anyway. Um, but this is basically how you would do it. You would take the URL and put it into the thing and then you'll be good. Why is this thing coming back the entire time? 
So let me move this down here, and let me move this down here. If so you had a collection of models, does it need to load them all before it will render? Or will it start it's one gigantic model, so it's going to start rendering yeah. once it has everything so if in. You, if you had a few different entities, they could then it would basically render as they are arriving from the network. Yeah. So if you have like smaller models, that's exactly, it's like, basically what happens is if you, if you would not have the single file version of this model, it would download the tiny JSON and then discover all the different bits and pieces and it would discover like the, the binary file, files for the, all the vertices and faces and it would discover the images and start downloading them in parallel and basically once it has everything that it needs to render, it would start rendering yeah. and, um, and we... It re renders other entities as well in the, in the background. So it's not like blocking everything. It's just like, obviously, if you have too many to actually download at the same time, because you have this like download limit of, I think, like 16 connections per uh, host, then that would start blocking. But without that, it wouldn't. OK, so what we haven't done so far is we haven't done uh, what's called hierarchies. So what we can do is we can actually conveniently put things inside of other things. So let's do like an A entity. Actually make the outside primitive a sphere and the color yellow. And then inside here we do like geometry primitive box. Well, this is a bit shit. No, let's, let's do sphere. Come on. Material color blue. Now and actually, probably also what's, what's going to be interesting is like we can do like scale, oops, a scale, and then go like 0 0.25, so 25% of the original scale. And now we only see like our gigantic, well, not gigantic, but our, our yellow blob here, our yellow blob. Where's our blue blob? Well, it's inside because it's at the same position. Um, so what we can do here is, as you can see, like this is now nested. This is a child of the other thing we can address it in the, edit, uh, in the inspector like this. So here you see like there's an entity, but now you have a tiny little blob on the side to it. So if I press on that, you see that there's like an entity hidden inside. Oh my God. And I can move it out. And hey, look at that. Hi, there's a little thing here. So now we have, I don't know, a sun and a planet. Nice. What's worth mentioning is that they are now hierarchically connected. So the sun is the parent of the little... Actually, let's, let's get them ID so that we can easily uh, spot them later on. So ID Earth. So if I now say I want to position them somewhere else, uh, and I'm going to do that in a second, I'm just going to clean up the code here a little bit as well. So it's a little easier to read on the projector. So if I now say, oops, position... Uh, let's say like three zero zero. You wouldn't be able to tell that this is like not the global position. This is a relative position to this one. But what happens if I'm now moving the sun? Maybe let's say like I move it to like minus five and maybe like one point six, so that's on eye level. And look at that, our little planet has moved with it. So the position of this little planet is no longer like in world coordinates. It's now in coordinates re relative to the sun. So basically what I'm saying is my sun is somewhere. Let's say like my sun is at like, I don't know. Um, so let's say this is zero, zero, zero. And my sun is at like zero, zero minus one. And now if I say the little, sun, uh, the little earth, which is like my child, will be at zero, zero, zero. It's going to be where I am. And if I move, it's going to be moving with me because it's attached to me, right? So if I say, like, can this please move one meter into the, oh, sorry, yeah, into the screen, like minus one, then it's going to be behind me because it's going always from where I am and not, like, in world coordinates. This is convenient for an interesting reason because we can do things like this. We can use this to create an animation. Uh, and we're going to do this not inside the Earth, because then it's going to spin the Earth, but we're going to do it inside the Sun. So on the same level as the Earth, we're going to do like A, animation. And I have to look up the syntax for this, because I, for the life of me, I can't remember the syntax. Um, because I think it's like prop, or is it attribute? It's out to attribute. Okay, cool. That's what I needed to know. So the animation uh, tag is using its parent, its direct parent, 
to change a property over time or an attribute over time. So I have to tell it which attribute I want to change. And uh, I can, for instance, say I want to change the position. And now if I say um, we start at, let's say, like minus 2, then I can say, actually it doesn't really matter, let's say like we start at 0 and then say like, I want to start from, and it takes the value that makes sense in the context. So in this case, this is a position, so we need to give it three numbers. So I say like, I want to start at minus 2, 1, 1.6, minus 5, whoops, uh, 2, 2, 1.6, minus 5. So it's going to move from the left to right. And I think it's like dur, not like actual duration, right? Yeah, it's dur. So we give it a duration for the time that this motion should take. And I would say like 5 seconds, so it's 5,000 milliseconds. And, um, and if we reload, you see that it does a motion. Hurrah! And it does it exactly once. Now there's a bunch of properties that I can set. For instance, I can set uh, repeat indefinitely, I think. I can never tell. It's like English not being my first language, I'm having a hard time actually spelling that right, to be honest. Yes, all right. So if you do like repeat indefinitely, it's going to keep repeating that animation. The problem now is that you can see that it doesn't do what you might want to, ex uh, to have it do, like it doesn't actually bounce between the two, it just basically restarts the, uh, the, the animation after like five seconds, it's like, hui, blip, hui, <laughs> it's not, not quite what we want. Um, so there is a few attributes down here, and this is like the nice thing. Everything that A-Frame comes with is really, really well documented, and you have like lots of documentation available. And if you find something that is unclear, you can edit the page or go to view source or go to GitHub and actually suggest that there should be an, uh, a fix being made. So this is nice. Um, and here's a direction property that you can set to alternate. So we, we do that. So actually, let me... Let me redo the uh, the way that we do these attributes so that it's a little easier. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, that's a tricky one. So um, there is a frame itself has an animation component, but there is a better one that uh, I don't go into because we would have to use an external component, and I would like to show you the a frame bits and pieces first. But it like it does say, and I would have actually mentioned that there is an external component done by Kevin Go. Um, that is having more possibilities because this is a limited component so for more cool stuff you can actually check out the A-frame animation component and they have like more things and they're a little little well well ahead of the actual thing unfortunately and they have things like you can have timeline to actually coordinate multiple animations and stuff like that it's just a little too much for a basic workshop I would say um, and like, you see like elasticity uh, they, they have a way to not round the values, start events, pause events, if it should autoplay. You can combine multiple animations, all that. Um, but we start with a simple animation, so we are now in the documentation for the, for the built-in animation component. Okay. But if, if you would have more complicated animations, I highly, highly recommend not using the A-frame component, but using the external one, uh, as it is more powerful. But for the simple ones, this one is perfectly fine. So if we now say direction alternate... We're getting this alternating pattern. Now, this is not quite what a star does, what a sun does. Um, but what we can do is, we can say, okay, maybe what we want to do is we want to change the rotation. And we're going to start from 0, 0, 0, which conveniently it is already, so we don't even need to mention that. And we want to rotate around, let's say, the... Um, <coughs> Yeah, let's say only the y-axis to begin with. Like, let's start with this. And we want to go 360, degree, 360 degrees. And I don't want the direction to alternate in this case because that's going to look weird. And here we are. Well, this is not quite how a rotation works, right? This is going to be, this is going to be a really, really weird day here. Um, why does that happen? Well, this is because of easing. By default, it eases in and out, so basically it becomes faster and slower to the, to the ends and the beginnings. So we would have to fix that. 
And we can do so by saying easing linear. So that's not actually doing like modification of the speed. We. We. So now we have a rotating Earth. That's nice. But there's a little bit of a problem. Actually, I want to show you something uh, real quick. Uh, and I'm going to go to Google Image Search. Obviously, don't do that for various copyright reasons, but I'm going to do it anyways. Sun surface. OK, let's, let's use, I don't know, let's use like this one. That sounds like a reasonable <coughs> thing. Uh, view, view image, copy image address. So in the materials, you can't just um, specify like a color, but you can actually also give it a source. So I can say like source, and then use an image source like this. And it's not working because probably this is an HTTP. No, this is an HTTPS URL. So what is the problem? Oh, is it one of the cases where? Uh, so the syntax has recently gotten a little inconclusive. Let's put it that way, um, because depending on the no, what's the problem here? Oh, it's a, oh shit! It's a ah, oh, it's cross origin shizzles. Ah, oh, come on. Okay, fine. What I'm gonna do is like I'm gonna save this image. Uh, why do I have to do this? And I'm going to upload it here to the assets. Boom. And as that is not a such a large file, it should actually upload relatively quickly. Da -da 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 -da. And here we have it. It's probably going to look weird, because I don't think it's a proper, um, proper uh, equirectangular image, but it's going to be fine. Um, so uh, cross origin, like seriously? Come on, don't be like that, people. Don't cross origin your things. Here we go. But now this is not what we want, right? It's weird that why would the sun rotate the same speed as the as the earth? This is not really what we want to do. And this is where the fact that oh my god, what the fuck is the projector doing? Do you see like the little halo behind the what the frip? This is not a fan, this is the projector. Nice. Whee. Okay, whatever. This is fascinating. Um, so if you remember from the very beginning, an entity is invisible, right? Unless we attach a component to it that makes it visible, it is invisible. So what we can do is we can change our code a tiny little bit. What we can do is we can say, hey, I would like um, this entity to maybe not rotate. Instead, we have like an invisible child that we put both the animation and the ah gee, both the animation and the earth goes in there. So I remove them here and I put them into this entity. And I move them in a little bit so that's easier to spot. And I pr should probably like do it like this. So it's a little easier to spot where the indentation comes in. So now we have the sun, and as child of the sun, we have an invisible entity, and the invisible entity has an animation, and the earth is relative to this particular uh, invisible entity. And now we have this effect. And it's not a performance problem, because an entity that has nothing to render does not render anything. So it's not having any overhead, really. It's a tiny little JavaScript instance in the rendering uh, list, but it's not actually rendered. So you don't have to worry about like performance problems with invisible entities. Regarding performance, I also wanted to highlight something else that is a pitfall that a lot of people get really, really confused with. So what happens if I put the Earth exactly around where the camera is at the beginning? Uh, sorry, the sun. So now this is confusing, right? Why am I not seeing the sun? I'm in the middle of the sun, but I'm not seeing anything. And the reason for that is a performance uh, um, optimization that is usually done, which is it assumes that if you have a an object 90% of the time. So if I have this object here, it doesn't make sense to render anything inside that is not visible from the outside. So basically, it tries to be clever and goes like, this part here, I actually don't have to render it because it's hidden. You can't see it, so why would I render it? So the problem with that is that it's, it's not necessarily like smart about if you're inside of the thing. So this is not rendering because the material is, by default, not rendering the insides. We can fix that. And um, if you look into the, no, that's the camera. I don't know want the camera. I want the, the, the sun. If you look at the material component, 
you see something where it says side and it has front. So this is like the, the outside of something. We can as well render the inside. And then here we are in the middle of the sun, which is probably not a good spot to be in. Um, but yeah, so now it's rendering the inside. But the fun thing is if I now go outside of the sun, it looks a bit weird, right? Because it's now only rendering the insides and not the outsides. So this is probably not what we want. What we want instead might be that we want to render both sides. So this has a performance impact because you're always rendering both sides. But it's sometimes the only thing that actually um, helps. So you might have things like, uh, let's say, a building with a window. And you want to see through the window into the building. And then the insides would not render if they would not be set up correctly. We actually, our models do that because we assume that only the insides of the walls are not something you want to render. So basically walls that are indoors are actually facing in the right direction. So it actually renders uh, correctly automatically. But yeah, that's a, that's a thing that you have to figure out. Also transparency is, is supported. You have to like set the transparent flag and then the opacity to like 0 0.5 for instance. And then we have like a half transparent sun. Sometimes that looks a bit weird and funky, and this is in this case because we're rendering double-sided, um, and it, it like doesn't know which side is the actual thing that it wants to render, so you want to avoid having double-side renderings uh, with most of the transparent objects because it, it just doesn't know which side it is showing where, so it's like giving this weird effect. Okay. Any questions so far? Could you just stop at the code? I can. Anything not working? <coughs> Anyone wondering about a thing? I'm trying to get to the animation. Mm -hmm. like I, I kind of just have like a, a stationary thing. How would you suggest debugging like an animation on? I'm not oh, that's a that's a tricky one. Um, look at the code and see. Like, so you have the animation um, at this. Like, yeah. So did it work in the beginning, or did it like n never ever work? I just haven't gotten an animation. Ah, right. Okay. Fair enough. So what you want to do is like the animation always animates the object that it is like its parent. Okay. So in this case, we have like the A entity is an invisible thing, but it has two children. It has the animation and the, the, uh, the earth. And the earth has an offset. So like the earth, because it's just a blue blob, if you would rotate it, you wouldn't see it. So you would have to move it off the origin, as I explained earlier with like the, the 3D models. I move this thing. So basically, let, let's have a look at this. I move this thing to the right three meters so that's off the origin of the actual entity, right? So we have this invisible entity here. I move the earth to the side. And now I have the animation as a child as well. And the, the animation is turning the invisible entity. And because this thing is off the origin, it does like the... So this is what should happen. Um, the next step would be to check the attributes. Because I think sometimes they are not very obvious. Like attribute rotation, OK, I get you that, but dir. It's like not the most obvious thing and repeat indefinitely. For me as a non-native English speaker, it's also pretty hard to spell right, to be honest. Um, and if all of that is right, then I would wonder why it's not working. Should I have a look? Now, can you just describe the structure again? Should it be an A scene? Like, let's say just the base would be an A scene, an empty entity, and then inside of it are two entities and an animation. Yeah, for instance. OK, so I'm going to try that, just adding <coughs> another like, entity on the outside. Like probably like the simplest thing you could build is something like this. So let's let's start with like an A entity uh, that is basically empty, and inside you have another A entity that is positioned slightly off. Let's say like three meters to the right, and uh, you have to give it something that is makes it visible. So like primitive sphere material. Wow, material color red. So let's do that. Let's put it here and let's put this here. And then on the same level of indentation, so in the same in the external, like in the surrounding entity, not in the entity that is the little sphere that we just created, you do like A animation and uh, attribute rotation two zero three hundred sixty zero dir three thousand maybe. This is like the smallest thing you can probably do. And then you should have 
Oh, it's not it's not moving. That's great. Um, ah, it's because ah, it actually might have moved. It's just like it has moved three seconds long, and that might actually have been passed already. So let's actually give it like the repeat. You won't see that move. It's a sphere of a solid color, though, will you? Sorry. You won't be able to see it rotate because it's a solid sphere. Uh, but it it wrote no 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 it, it, yeah this is this is where it's confu uh, where I find it confusing when I learned this uh, this stuff is um, it it is a solid sphere that is correct but it's not rotating around itself because and let me repeat that again look at look at the structure real clear so basically um, oh, yes the animation is going to its parent yeah. right so actually I can I can like collapse oh shit the collapsing is not really helping much is it. Um, yeah, so basically this, this would rotate this invisible entity and the sphere is slightly off the origin. So that should actually rotate around me and it does. Whee. I love the blur on the projector. It's like the best thing ever. Can you describe from here if you want now like, uh, so now I have like the smaller sphere spinning just around the, the camera. Mm -hmm. How do you make that center point now move out to where the other sphere is? What I then do is, uh, where's the other sphere actually? Is right, okay, it's right where we are. So let's, let, let's say like it's minus five. Yeah. Um, I move this top level entity where the other thing is. Or, so that's one, one way of doing it. So that basically I would have to like figure out it's like zero, one way six, minus five. And I might want to actually move this somewhere else. Let's say like I move this to five maybe, because I don't want to have them like rotate on the same it has the easing, okay, I give you that. It's like still doing like the weird easing thing. But basically now this, this does the thing. But this has the downside of if I now move the sun down here, right? So I say like minus five, then the sun and the earth has moved, but this one thing hasn't moved, right? So if I want to make that follow, what I would do is I would take the entire thing, let's, let's call this like, uh, I like to call them anchors because they're kind of like invisible anchors, right? So I call this the anchor and then I use the entire blob here and I would move that into the same entity as the sun or actually make it a child of the sun that works as well. So I would make the entire anchor a child of the sun and then um, the anchor would not have to actually be positioned off the sun because I wanted it to be like the same point as where the sun is so I can do that. And now I have like the, whoops, okay. Now I have the effect that this is moving with the sun. So if I move the sun back to zero on the x-axis, the red thing still rotates around the sun. Okay. So you have to be like, it actually, I really, really, really love the uh, inspector for this because you get like this tree structure nicer here, right? So now we see like the sun has two children. One is the anchor for the blue little planet and one is the anchor for the red little planet. And then you have like the entity of the red planet is a child of this entity of the anchor, and then you have the same setup here for the Earth. Right, so you get this like hierarchical um, relationship. Okay. Uh, let's say as far as the positioning. Uh, so I guess the, like, the understanding I have is that you give each entity a position. Yeah. And then any entities inside of it, the position you give adds like to it. Yes, that correct. Are. That is correct. Okay. Like if you have these these hierarchies, then the positions are always like relative to its to its parent, and that actually is is true for all of them. Right? The, I mean, the sky has a position that is relative to the scene. It's always relative to the parent, and if you share the parent, then you share the offsets. Okay, so you can either take the the entity that is the parent of the animation and put that inside of the entity of the bigger planet, yeah. or you can have them be two separate entities and just position them. To Yes, correct. With, with the downs, like the second one with the downside that if I move the thing, then the other thing does not automatically move right, with yeah, it, right? It's like, exactly, you have to then figure that one out. So basically, you can use invisible entities to group items and then make sure that they stick together. Which is actually what happens under the hood when you load 3D models, because a lot of 3D models are actually made from individual smaller bits and pieces that you can address individually. Um, and you don't see that because it's normally not exposed to you, but basically it's exactly the same thing. Like you have one 
container entity that is invisible and then all the small, let's, let's say you have a robot, right? And you have like the two arms of the robot and the two legs of the robot and the head of the robot. But you don't want to have to like say like, I'm now moving the head and the leg and the other leg to the same new position, but you want to kind of have this all go in one, one place. So basically what the loader does is it creates an empty entity that holds everything, the entire robot, and it only gives you the robot. But then internally the animations bits and pieces actually address the individual arms and stuff. So yeah. And um, yeah, sometimes it's like super convenient to actually have access to this kind of stuff. So let's use um, any other questions, by the way? Anything unclear? As again, let me repeat what I said earlier on. One second. This is for you, so if something's unclear, I screwed up, and I'd really, really love to have your question and, and uh, figure out A, how to better explain it next time, and B, make this work for you. Yes? In the inspector, uh, or I guess in the scene, you can press A, S, D, W to move this way. Yes. How do you move up and down? Very good question. So. Uh, actually, we haven't touched that topic yet, but uh, it is, I wonder if they have it here, yes. So, as you can see, like the, the camera that gets inserted into the, into the document automatically, and we can do our own if we want it, um, has not only like a bunch of, of properties itself, but it also has two components, the look controls and the WASD controls. Look, look controls are the, the mouse dragging around, or if you're in VR, your head motion. So the look controls are what makes the camera move with your head if you're using one of the VR headsets. Um, and the WASD controls are literally like moving around in space. Or if you have a headset like the HTC Vive or the Oculus Rift that also tracks position in the room, then it also lets you literally walk around in the room automatically. So, and if you want to fly, that is a setting for the WASD controls where you literally just have to say like, I want to fly. So there's like a little checkbox here. Let me move, zoom in a little bit. Whoop! So you have in the WASD controls, you have a fly parameter. Which entity are you in at the moment? That's the camera entity. Okay. So I, I, I selected the camera here. Yep. And um, what does that actually? Yes. And now if I'm looking up and we use W, then you see that I'm flying up over the so it, it now actually doesn't, it no longer restricts my movement to the, uh, to, the, to the ground plane, but it actually lets me move whatever. Be aware that this does not work in VR for the obvious reasons that if you are like having the position data from the HTC Vive, it's going to use that. It's not going to let you fly up. So you can actually fly. Yes, it is possible to do that. It's just like you would have to probably use a different way of controlling things. Um, and you can, I, have, I think I've never done that, but it's, it's definitely possible. With the, for instance, with the cardboard, it shouldn't be a problem because with the cardboard, you don't have position data, so you can just like move the user where they look, for instance, uh, and then that would work probably. Also, there's an interesting thing. If you're, if you're using the URL that Glitch gives you on your phone, you're going to see something interesting um, because the, the look controls that are automatically used, uh, let me go to like fortunate dash tendency, that's an interesting one, tendency dot glitch dot me. You get what's called the magic window function, which can be like super nice or can be super terrible. Because if you're then like turning around in the room, you're actually turning the camera and that's what the look controls do automatically. So um, I can show you why that is not necessarily the best thing ever. Like it's super cool, but it's not always what you want. So if I now load, it takes this as zero and basically it, it shows you, actually my, my screen is like super dark, I should probably crank up this. Okay, right, you see, you see the sun here, right? Everyone sees it? And I can now like move my phone, that's cool. But now imagine that I'm, I'm I don't know, I'm walking somewhere, now I'm sitting down in the train like this. I see nothing and I have to actually like move my head around or reload the page. So it's not always what you want, but it's kind of like an interesting 
interesting thing. Um, it's an interesting default, I would say, uh, to start from. And if you don't want that, you would have to remove the, the look controls uh, and find something else that does the right thing for your scene. Okay, is everyone back? Everyone seeing the people next to them, or are we? Are we? Did we lost someone to the to the coffee break? I think there's like two people missing for the coffee break. Ah, bum. We'll wait a few more seconds. Also, another tip that I keep seeing people make a mistake with. So you can place a camera. I'm going to explain that in more detail later on. But basically, what you can do is you can say like. Uh, I want my own camera and I can say like I, a entity camera and hey look at that we have a camera. Uh, first things first if I do that and reload you might notice that I can no longer use the mouse or the keyboard to move around so if you do that like you lose the default camera which aut automatically has the controls attached to them. But also what some people unfortunately like to do and this is really unfortunate is they position the camera somewhere. So let's say like I put the camera to like I don't know, the five meter, uh, sorry, zero, zero, five, let's say like that. And this is nice for a regular like 3D thing and it looks okay and great, but what do you think happens if I'm going into VR? Is it going to look like that? It's not. And the reason is that if, for instance, I'm using an HTC Vive, uh, I actually have a position in the room, right? Because the HTC Vive tracks the room. So I know where in the room I am, so that's where the camera will automatically move to. And even worse, if I am uh, using a cardboard or a Google uh, a cardboard, uh, uh, sorry, a Daydream or something like that, it's going to start at, it doesn't have position data, so it starts at 0, 0, 0, and then that's where the camera moves. So I'll not be where I think I am. And I've seen that a lot of people like mix that up and basically like when like, oh, but my, ob like my 3D object that I found on the internet and I'm using uh, is unfortunately not positioned around the origin. So it's like in 10 meters over there and 50 meters over there. So I'm just going to move my camera there instead of moving the object around the origin. With the downside that they, it looks great on the, on the computer and they're like, yeah, this is awesome. This is great. Let's, let's send it out. And then the first person to put it onto VR goggles is like, I'm, I'm standing in nowhere and back in the, at the horizon in like 50 meters away from me is something, but I don't know, I don't know how to get there, right? And that's, that's a problem. So you always want to make sure that the, the origin position makes sense, which means you might want to move like your objects and your scenery around to make it match the origin position. But you can't guarantee they'll start at zero, zero, zero. Right? You can't guarantee that, um, but... It is, it is more like, like the, let's, let's face it, like the maximum room size, I think, that the HTC Vive supports is like 6.5 meters. So you could theoretically just move over. So you, but you want to make sure that you've got like about a 6.5 meter range that you could be a not, necessar not necessarily, but like you can, you can for instance, uh, try to figure out the position at start and then like move things around a little bit or something like that. And actually, I think recently Firefox fixed it and now you actually always start at 0, 0, 0 and it just adapts to to where it should be, but I think it wasn't like that in the beginning. So it's a reasonable assumption. That it's a reasonable assumption that 000 is a good point to start with. Uh, but actually there's like, VR has a lot of interesting challenges. Um, one of them being, now cool, you have an HTC Vive, but A, not all your users are gonna use that. Some are being on uh, cardboards, for instance. Actually, most of them are probably on cardboards. Um, and B, what happens if I have an HTC Vive, but I only have like two by two meters, I think the, the minimum is like 1.5 meters by 1.5 meters space, and now I have a 10 meter room. How does that work? <laughs> and the answer to that is there's a thing called teleport controls, and you can use a controller to actually like teleport you somewhere, like you point on the floor and then you teleport there. It's better. But then you have the UX problem that not everyone knows how that works. It's not obvious how this works. And uh, yeah, it's like a lot, of, a lot of work has to be done. So what we experimented with is, um, I don't remember the URL, so be, be nice with me right now because I'm basically doing something off script. I love to like do things that just come to my mind, but sometimes it backfires, which is like super annoying. 
Um, so then an experiment that I did that works with pretty much everything is you have this cursor uh, that looks, uh, so basically works where you look at. So you look at this thing. Unfortunately, aha, now the model is loading. And to move, I look on the ground and it should trigger, but it's obviously not triggering because screw me, that's why. Here we go. Oh, great. I broke it. As I said, I go off script. This is like the fun thing. Ah, OK, now it's not broken. Nice. That's probably an old version that has like a maximum range or something. So basically, you look on the ground, and then you move there. You teleport there. Oh, shit, I teleported through the model. So I probably want to teleport back real quick. And then like look at this thing, and then it goes whoop. And I did user tests. And uh, my sample size is super small, so don't quote me on it. My sample size is like 20 people. Um, and, and I tested with people who have never done VR before with a cardboard, and they understood what they had to do. So people understand this way of, of navigating. It's like, so how can I move over there? Just look on the ground. Oh, yeah, it makes sense. And actually, I only had to tell like three people that, and the other people just knew what they had to do magically. So this is... But again, it's like 20, sample size 20 is like nothing. So basically, just don't trust me on that one. <laughs> um, but yeah, so there's like uh, a lot of stuff going on, and it's going to be super interesting. And with AR, for instance, you don't have that problem because you are using the real world as a, as a reference point. So um, moving around is not that much of an issue. And yeah, lots of interesting user experience things going on. And uh, the, the best moment I had was when, when I felt so bad for like making a bunch of UX mistakes in one of our projects. And then I went to a conference um, where they had someone demoing VR. And they had like a room escape game. And the user had five minutes to escape from the room. And pretty much every user that tried it took like three minutes to figure out how teleport works. And, and they were like super, super confused about everything. Like, so how do I, oh, this is how I move. All right, OK. Oh, oh my time is over already? What? And uh, I'm like, yes, it's not just me. So yeah, teleport controls are really super nice, but not obvious to people. Yet. We're going to see that. Also, by the way, how many, how many let's say, uh, Oculus Rifts do you think have been sold in 2016? I don't have the numbers for 2017, unfortunately. Like, worldwide. Just a rough ballpark. A million? 10 million? OK, less. What? I'd be guessing hundreds of thousands. Probably not. Hundreds of thousands is around the right ballpark. It's like, I think it's like 400,000 or something. HTC Vive's global sales in 2016 were, I think, like 500,000-ish. Um, how many cardboards do you think have been sold? I want to have a guess in the, what, like, what, is it, is it hundred thousands or is it millions or? How many millions do you think? Less than 10. Less than 10. Yeah has been 82 million devices oh, in the market. And that's only like the official channels because you can get like weird knockoff things from AliExpress or something like that. And yeah, they don't count, I think. So it's like, it's, it's bananas. So this is like the reality or has been at least the reality of VR in like 2016, beginning of 2017. I still haven't found numbers for 2017. So I'm really, really looking forward to see when the numbers come out for, the, for last year. Because I expect that to change a little bit, but it's like, just, just seeing that. Let me see if I actually I have slides for tomorrow, so you're gonna get like a super sneak peek of what you're so totally not supposed to see right now. But I, I just the the graphic is just like beautiful. Um, I hope that I have it in this version of the talk. I might have removed it. Ah, damn it! I don't have it in this one. In that case, you see something that no one else is gonna see. Um, I'm gonna go to an older version of this talk because I'm pretty sure I had. Uh, a chart somewhere uh, that was like super fun to look at because it's just like bananas. Where is it? Ah, here we go. Yes. No, 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 no. Don't just jump ahead of myself. Okay, here we go. So like this is this has been like the VR market in 2016, right? You have like Oculus Rift, HTC Vive, PlayStation VR is actually doing pretty well. Daydream has just entered the market uh, that that year, so it's like. This is comparing a full year against like maybe a quarter maximum. And then you have like the Gear VR, 
that outsells them is like 2.2 million units and then you have like the card whoops the cardboard <laughs> <laughs> slightly more so it's like pretty pretty impressive i might actually enter these slides back into my talk for tomorrow so the cardboard do you just have one button as your interaction at most yeah okay. Because there's older versions of cardboards that do not have a button. Like they have this magnetic thing that basically works with no phone. And yeah, so you have one button as an interaction. And obviously the gaze of the user where the user is looking at. And then like there's this established pattern of having a gaze cursor. But yeah. That's what I mean is that you lose the ability to do like any type of key navigation. Absolutely. <laughs> and it doesn't have position tracking. So it doesn't know where in the space you are. So you can't do like, oh, I'm going to... No, look down here, that doesn't work. It only has the orientation, so it only looks, it knows where you look at. So that's like, yeah, that's the harsh reality. So I, I mean, it's kind of interesting to see, like a lot of people are building, um, building VR applications specifically for like one type of hardware. And then it's mostly like the high-end things, like, oh yeah, we have this amazing demo for Oculus Rift. I'm like, cool, what happens when I open that in my cardboard? <laughs> Uh, right. So it's, it's like it's it's not easy. Luckily, this um, a frame has this lovely thing called progressive controls. So they are basically like upgrading themselves, and you get like more interactions. So for instance, for click, uh, it figures out oh this is a thing that doesn't have any controllers attached to it. So I'm just gonna use the gaze. So you have a little cursor that like zooms in onto a point, and then actually it fires a click event on the object that you have looked at last. Uh, and that's like super nice. And if you then have a cursor, like a, a, sorry, a controller, then it goes like, oh, there's a controller. That's like super nice. And if it's like a cardboard controller, you only get one thing. So I can then actually point at something and like press the button and it's a click event. So the rest of the code doesn't care. And then I have two controllers because I have an Oculus Rift and I'm like, ooh, that's nice. Pew, you basically have like a laser kind of thing going from the controllers and you're like, okay, click. And it does a click event. So the rest of the code still doesn't care. Um, I'm not going to lie, it's not always that easy because some, some interactions are just not easy to map. Like for instance, when you have something where you edit things, if you have two controllers and you know that, then you can just go like, yeah, and I'm going to drag these out. How do you do that on a cardboard? Not easy. Does not naturally come like immediately, obviously. Um, but you can detect what you've got and then there's like things I saw I made that mistake a lot of times a lot of times and I got myself really angry with myself So that's kind of cool because I learned something there um, When I built something for the HTC Vive, I was like I have two controllers. so I'm gonna make use of two controllers But they are wireless controllers So they do have a battery in them so this one might actually run out of power eventually and they do not always like need to be recharged at the same time. So I, I ran, ran into a lot of situations where I knew the hardware I would be using, but I assumed that I have two controllers when I really only had one because the other one needed recharging. So I was like, and now I use this uh, second controller, which is, uh, hmm. and then you go out and like the entire immersion is broken. It's not, not, not very good. So don't assume things like number of controllers or system that you're on. Assume cardboard and then enhance based on that. Unless you really, 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 really know the, uh, the setup that you've got. So for instance, I built a demo for Google Chrome Dev Summit where I knew that I would have like recharged controllers all the time because it's basically a short demo and straight back to the charger. Um, and I had an HTC Vive, so I actually just optimized for that but it's not a good idea to do that for WebVR because the promise of WebVR is it responsively responds to the environment you're in and it works everywhere. And if you're not making sure that it does, then you're probably letting your users down, which is not something that you want to do. All right, moving swiftly on. Uh, any, any other questions? Anything you're wondering about? Anything that's not working? No? Okay. Well, let's, let's go back to the camera thing that I was talking about real quick. Um, and then we're going to have a look at lighting as well. So as, as I said, this weird thing here with the, with the orange lines and the white line, that's our camera. And that's nice because uh, A-Frame automatically adds this for us if we are not doing it. 
So I can click on the camera in the left hand side um, scene graph and then on the right hand side the the entity pops up and we have like a bunch of components. We have like a camera component um, that has the field of view of 80 degrees. We can change that to let's say like 60 degrees and we just have a like tighter field of view. It doesn't really matter that much. I would just leave it like that. Uh, we can specify the user height. So if for some reason we are mostly around people that are 1 meter 80, then we just change it to 1 meter 80. Um, but it also has added other components. So it's not only the camera component, it's also look controls and WASD controls. And look controls and WASD controls are components that make the camera respond to input. So we can move WASD, we can use the WASD keys to move around, and we can use the look controls to use the mouse to drag around. Or in VR, um, this would then also be, be using the orientation. So if I put my phone into, into a VR headset, uh, this one does not know where in the room I am, but it knows if I'm looking in that direction or in that direction. So that's what the look controls do. If you disable the look controls, the user can't turn their heads. You can do that, but prepare to have a bucket around because people then usually vomit. It's a bucket full of fun to do that. Um, you can also create your own camera. You don't have to rely on the camera that uh, A-Frame gives you. So let's do like an, an A-Entity camera here. A-Entity camera. So you're not going to see a difference except for the problem that you can no longer move with WASD or turn with the mouse. Or even in VR you would just like get the, the straight look and it's not going to do anything useful. Um, it also allows you parameters like the, the user height that I specified earlier on. So we can give it like the user height of 1 meter 60 or 1 meter 80 or whatever. Um, notice here there's an important bit right there, which is I would always use this instead of, because you can basically do what you could do and you should not do is you could do like position zero, zero, uh, zero, 1 meter 60, 0, right? And it kind of looks the same, right? Except that if you're now going into VR, you're going to see something weird happen. And what's going to happen there is that in VR, it assumes or it tries to get the actual camera position in, in, what X, uh, sorry, in, in Y direction and also in the other directions if possible. And what happens if I do it in a cardboard or in a Google Daydream or a Google, uh, sorry, Samsung Gear VR? Um, it's going to set it to 1 meter 60. There's like a, a sane default or whatever we set in user height that's going to be used. So if I put my camera onto 1 meter 60 in position, it's going to add 1 meter 60 on top of that. So then we are 3 meter 20 tall, which is very unusual for humans, uh, for most humans at least. It's going to be an interesting experience, but unless that's what you want, that's going to be weird. And also if you have the actual height, um, it is kind of nice to, to be actually like as tall as you are in, re in the real life. So Oculus and uh, HTC actually give you this information, so you should use it. And user height takes that into account, position does not. right? So you don't want to do that. You want to leave it where it is. Um, you can also, put, obviously you can position it anywhere else. Like I can do like 0, 0, minus actually, you know, 10, just plus 10. So you go really, really far away. But I said that earlier on, but I'm going to repeat it for, for people grabbing a coffee in the meantime. If you do that, the problem is that once you start VR, you are actually at 0, 0, 0 with the camera, or even like in the room, if you move around the room, if your uh, VR gear supports that. Um, so what's going to happen is it's going to not look like you expect it to look like. So what you should be doing is you should be keeping the camera at 0, 0, 0 and assume that that's like a reasonable thing. So we can leave this out actually. We can also do animations with the camera. So let's do that. Let's just for, for shits and giggles, A animation, uh, attribute, rotation to 0, 360, 0, duration, 5 seconds. And now our camera turns. Hui! If your user is using VR goggles and that, this is when I'm not going to look at the screen. Yeah.
that's that's where vomiting happens. Um, so don't do that. Don't move the camera. You can do that as long as you know that you're not in VR. Can and you check that? You can check that. You can actually... Um, I would have to double check. I'm relatively sure that it's on the A scene, actually. There is a property somewhere. Uh, oh, I don't know. But there's, it's in the docs. Let's, let's uh, check the docs, because this is actually important um, to know. My brain's not working that well when it comes to remembering things, so I need documentation for everything. <laughs> um, it has, it sends you events, that's for sure, and I'm pretty sure it also has a, uh, it has a component that actually gives you the in information, but this is the wrong thing. It does definitely have a property somewhere, but you could listen for events as well. Like Enter VR and uh, Exit VR gives you definitely this information. Um, that you need. Isn't it giving us... All oh, right. So you want to listen to these events to figure that one out. Uh, we do that for camera tours um, because it's just like it's not a good pattern to... Never in VR, never you move the user's point of view unless they expect it to move. So if you have like a roller coaster ride, it is fine because you have a reference point that moves. Do not just move the camera around, move an object around the user, be it like a carriage or a train coach or whatever, or like anything, an elevator is fine as well. Just never ever just move the user without the user willingly doing that. And that starts with things like teleporting is always already a, like a gray area. Cool, now if we want to get back like the look controls and WASD controls, we just add them like this, ASD controls. So now it's basically the back to the original functionality. So I can look around with a mouse and with a keyboard I move. And on a, on a VR headset like these that we have here, we would still be able to like look around, um, but we wouldn't be able to move actually because it doesn't have position information. These people, uh, sorry, these, these uh, headsets do not have position information, unfortunately. We can also control some of the parameters. So. For instance, you might have noticed that when we have the WASD controls, we're always moving on the same plane. So we're not actually moving up or down. And this entire like user height missing actually makes me nervous. So that I just like add it in. So now we can only move like forward and backward and left and right. We can't move up or down. Like we can't fly around. Um, what we can do in the WASD controls, it has a fly property uh, or, or uh, attribute that allows us to basically change that. And if we look up and use W, then we're actually flying up. If we look down and use W, we fly down and stuff like that. So now we have like flying controls. That does not mean that in VR you can fly, unfortunately. You would have to implement that yourself. I don't think there's anything that does that automatically. OK. Let me move some of the things here. So, there's also lighting coming into play here. Um, as I said, like 3JS, uh, not <laughs> A-Frame automatically adds lights. Um, so we don't have to, which is nice. But maybe we want to have different lighting conditions. So what we can do is we can do like A entity slash A entity, and then we give it a light. How do we do that? Well, there's a component for that. So we do like light. Now we have to figure out what type of light we want. And uh, one of the easiest types is the ambient light. Ambient light is basically like daylight. It doesn't come from a certain direction. It's just like all around us. And uh, it shouldn't be too bright because it's going to apply to all the things, all the faces, all the objects in our uh, scene. So what we can do is like we can give it a color let's say blue. <coughs> now this is really, really dark blue, so that's not the best idea I had. So let's actually um, give it a slightly brighter, I don't know. Cyan? Yeah, it's actually not a good, not a, not a bad idea. Let's, let's try the cyan. So 
Now you see something uh, curious. It's actually not that easy to spot on the on the projector. Maybe if I go closer, no, it's actually really really hard to see. But on your screen, the sun is now like greenish, and that's because the the blue. Well, actually, the cyan light mixes with the color of the suns. Like so, we have like this orangey color and cyan mixing into this like weird greenish color. If I would instead um, of using this this particular image, if I would use a color, a plain color, let's say like, ah, uh, come on, I use color white. Then the sun is no is actually not white. It's actually using the light color. Right. And you also see something else. If I move around the sun, as I as I mentioned earlier. The problem with the ambient light is it doesn't have any direction. Uh, it's just everywhere. And that's usually a good idea, but you should never like use super bright colors. If you need an ambient light that gives you some colors, probably use like a, a darkish gray. Um, and then use other lights on top of it. By the way, if you want like a night scene, you can also abuse this um, by actually just like putting a black light in. So this is now a night scene because it doesn't actually have anything that's like driving it. So if I don't use that, if I use a, like a darker blue, that's actually still like too bright. Let's use like a super dark blue. Yeah. So now we have like a light scene and you don't see anything. That's not not very interesting, right? So what we probably want to do is we want to want to use more interesting lights. Let's let's start with a point light. Let's start with a point light that we position. Uh, we don't have any positioning here, so it's at where the camera is below the camera actually, but it's like where we are. And we give it a color, let's say cyan, just because we had like that early on. I shouldn't use like the, the hash type point. And then we see that now we actually do have like a light bulb that is below the camera that lights straight onto our, well, sun. If you want to call it a sun, um, actually let's let's make the the sun yellow again. Just you know. Now the cyan color shines on the yellow sphere, making it green. It's probably not exactly what we want, so we can make this white, and then it looks like what we would expect. If we wanted to make the sun glow, we put an ambient light. Ah, that's an interesting one. Not an ambient light, but you could put a point light into the sun. So what I can do is I can take this. Uh, make it a child of the sun. And it's not quite what you would expect, probably. We're going to see that in a second. So this is not what you expect, right? No. no. And what, the reason why this is, is because we have a problem. So how, how does lighting actually work? Let me, let me quickly... It's going to be... In the, this, is one of, this is one of my favorite explanations. Um, because it's actually pretty simple, but it's, it's not obvious. So how do we calculate light? Well, let's have, a, have an example here. Uh, we have a light source there, and we have a surface here, right? And now, obviously, I have it like black, but technically this is like fully bright, as bright as the projector uh, makes it, based on the light coming from the projector hitting this fully frontal. Now, what does fully frontal mean? Well, if you think about it, this surface here is facing in that direction, and the light coming in faces in that direction. There's 180 degrees between the two. So it's like full on. It's 100% light of the light that comes from that direction hits this surface. Now what would happen if I would start to move the surface like this? Right? Now it's no longer the same. Now we have a different angle. Now we have like the light coming this way, the surface facing this way, so we have 45 degrees. So we only have like half of the light actually hitting it. If you think about it, it's like half of the light kind of like goes bonk and goes somewhere else and then only half of the light actually comes back to our eyes. If I would like lift it up entirely, and I can't actually do that far, but basically if I would lift it up to 90 degrees so that it faces this way and the light comes from here, the surface is not being affected by the light at all. Now how do we model this in computers? Because we can't actually like you know, shoot light rays and then see what happens in the real world and then somehow like map that. No, what we have to do is we have to figure this one out differently. And what you can do is, it's relatively easy to figure out based on the geometry, it is not too hard to figure out where something's facing. The direction something is facing is called the normal vector, right? 
So if we, if we go into our coordinate system, x being like this, y being like this, and z being like this, the light has a vector of minus 1, like so 0, 0, because it doesn't go to the left or to, the, uh, to up or down. So basically, 0, 0, and then minus 1, because it goes in this direction. The length of the vector doesn't matter, so we're just going to set the length to 1. We normalize the vector, that's what it's called. And then we have the normal vector from the surface going the exact opposite way. So it's like 0, 0, 1. So now what we can do is we can figure out from the textbooks or Google how to actually calculate the angle between the two. And then we have the angle. So we would know, OK, 180 degrees, and we want 100% of the light. If we have 90 degrees, we want 0% of the light. And if we have 45 degrees, we want 50% of the light. How do we model this in an equation? Hmm. If you do a bit of trigonometry and look at like circles and Pythagoras and, and uh, all that kind of stuff, eventually, or if you just Google for it, that's an, uh, an alternative to this, a function that with an angle of z uh, 180 degrees is 1 and with an angle of 90 degrees is 0 happens to be cosine. So this is how lighting works in computer graphics. You're not doing like any magical sorcery. You're just figuring out my light goes that way, my surface faces that way, what's the angle between them, cosine that, and we have how much color we got. Right? So basically we have like, let's say we have um, a, a, a red color here and a white color here. We just multiply the two with the cosine and then that's it. That's what happens. So it's like cosine of 180 is 1, cool. 1 times 1, which is like br the bright white light, plus 1 only for red, and then you basically just get that together, and then you have like a fully lit white, um, or sorry, red uh, uh, sphere here. And obviously because the sphere has more faces facing in the other directions, you do that for each of these faces, and then you get the different shades of a color. This is why you get like, you know, the, the oh, come back, okay. Why it's not as bright here as it is here. This is all it does ish. Like this is the simplest way of doing this kind of lighting. It's called Lambert lighting. Lambert lighting has a problem. It has multiple problems actually. First things first, uh, when we do that for, for each of the faces, if these faces are very large, it's not going to look as good. Uh, we can, we can uh, simulate that by going into the inspector, clicking on the sphere, and somewhere here it should have segments, yes. So let's set the segments to a relatively low number and go back. So now you see like we are not having as many, like the shape is not as round anymore. And maybe I should actually stop rotating it because it's like super annoying. Um, can you maybe not rotate? That'd be like super cool. Thank you. And I should have said, so here it looks kind of nice, right? It looks kind of smooth. Actually, I'm not, never sure how, how well the projector does. Um, <laughs> But if I remember, like if I re reduce the number of, of vertices and faces, then it's not going to look as smooth. And you see like the lighting also does not look as nice anymore. It's a little rougher here and it's like not as nice here. And that's because we do it once per face. There's also ways of, of doing like more calculations by doing it for each of the vertices and then like interpolating between the two. Um, so that's another way of doing it. But like this is the way that Lambert does it. And the other problem is if I want this to make it like super shiny, then I'm not going to have, and I can actually re return, actually let's just reload, um, to the smoother thing. But you see like it's not very shiny, right? There's no like nice shiny light. And that's because this, this Lambert equation does not allow that. We would have to make sure that something that is coming straight on it is much, much brighter and then quickly stops being as bright around the same like, like angles. So there's different equations and one of them being the Fong equation that allows more complicated lighting situations. And uh, conveniently, you don't have to worry about it. I just wanted to let you know that these exist. If you hear like Fong shading, that's like shiny, glossy, um, uh, metal-y uh, materials. And Lambert shading is like silky, smooth materials. We can fix that lighting problem if you want to make this like more glossy. Conveniently, by just increasing a value here. We don't have to worry about all this kind of stuff. What we can do is we can say, hey, um, can we be like more metally and I can like set it to a value of one for instance and then like, it's like super shiny. Uh, it's probably like even too shiny because like the spotlight is like super bright. 
So now this looks more metal-y, I would say, because it has this spotlight, it has this highlight over here. It's going to look nicer on your um, computer screens probably than on this screen, but hey. Um, so I can say like metalness 0. Point, let's say like 75, so 75% metal. And then you get like a nice highlight uh, instead. But now the question was, how can we make the sun like shine and look nice? Yes, we can. The problem is with the light in internally, it doesn't mean that it actually lights up the surface because the surfaces are like, the surface of the sun goes like this way, the light goes like this way, eh, zero degrees, not going to be nice. What we want to do instead is we want to set a different type of color. So what this is actually like misnamed a bit because in computer graphics books, you're going to find this as the diffuse color. Now, what does diffuse color mean? Diffuse color is the color that um, is being reflected from the surface because that's how lights work or how material colors work, right? If you have a green car, it means that uh, red and blue are absorbed and green is reflected. So that's basically, it's diffused. It spreads the light in different directions. Is a reflection is when it comes exactly back where it came from and diffuses when it like, like, you know, goes astray a little bit. So this is the diffuse color. If we want this to shine a light or like looks shiny, then we would have to emit light, right? Because the sun looks like it looks because it emits light. Now, this is not the same as having the light there. The light that you put there, the point light that we put in the sun, is lighting up other things. It's not lighting up the sun because we're inside the sun and it doesn't work with the angle. So we have to set the emissive color as well. I can say, actually, no, no, I'm now doing it on the red sphere. That's not a, bad, not a good idea. Abort mission, abandon ship. So emissive yellow. And look at that. <laughs> um, that's a tricky one. Uh, theoretically, hypothetically, it should work when you set up the... So let's see. Actually, that's a good question. Yeah. I know how to do it in Blender. <laughs> but um, I'm not exactly sure. Actually, we have textures here. They're going to look weird, but it, it proves the point. Um, so... Oh, no. Actually, I do have the actual texture that I wanted. Oh, so, well, completely forgot about that. We downloaded this here because of course origin shizzles. Um, okay, so let's like source this. And uh, that's what I thought. So this is, this is gonna be tricky. You're probably gonna have to write your own material to make that work. I don't think it actually, what happens when I say like, can I, can I actually do that? Never tried it. No, it doesn't support, because there's no such thing as an emissive map. So you would probably have to do this like differently. Um, a way to fake it, is to, let's see, uh, <laughs> this is nice. A way to fake this, and I actually don't know the, the parameters for this again, um, so we're gonna look them up, is to actually say that it should not, it should not care about light, because there's different ways, like, light in a 3D scene is not something that you physically, intrinsically have to have, it's something that you choose to need if you want that. So you can actually tell it to like ignore lighting at, entirely. And I think, aha, here we, here we go, uh, flat shader. Is that the thing that I want, standard material? Do I get to actually pick a different material? I wonder. How do I set, like, hmm. I'll try something, because I've never used that property now that I think about it. So let's see what happens. Um, it's called shader basic. I don't know if that's the right thing. No, it's not. Okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> I kind of expect that to happen. We're getting somewhere. I'm not exactly sure where we are getting, but it's interesting anyways. Is it a flat shader? Because it's... Aha, right. So a flat shader, um, it's a bit confusing because it, uh, A-Frame uses 3JS under the hood and 3JS calls it a basic material and the basic material just ignores light and just uses its color. Um, and here it's like a flat shader, which to me is something different, but okay, whatever. Um, 
So basically by saying that you want the shader to be flat rather than the standard, you get a shader that ignores lighting entirely and just uses the texture that you give it. And which effectively looks, if the texture is right, looks like it's emitting light, but it's actually not emitting light. Okay, so now we have like this wonderful little scene with the sun and the little planet orbiting it. Actually, let's find a, an, an Earth texture as well, just why not? So how do you make it glow? Very good question, not as easy. Um, for glowing, you would have to write your own material in an old shader. I think there might be an effect for it. Um, let's, actually, let's actually look for it. I don't, I don't know for sure. Actually, uh, if you set uh, light, uh, light type to hemisphere and put it inside the sun, it works as expected without materials. Uh, right. Property. Hemisphere light. Yeah. Um, it's like a, a bright pink. But it doesn't have a position. The hemisphere light shouldn't have a position. Make it look like this. And, uh, oh, okay. Yeah, it uh, looks more or less looks nice. So. But are you sure it looks the same on the on the back of the sun? Um, if you go if you go around the sun, I'm relatively sure with the hemisphere light you might not see, because hemisphere lights are basically working like the natural sun would work on the Earth. So they shine in one direction. It's, it's like a point uh, light, but it's bigger. And if uh, I believe if I set uh, hemisphere size bigger, it shine light. might work. But I'm, I would be surprised because it's normally literally meant to like shine on one side of a thing and not like all around it. I would be surprised if that works. But you know, if if you're right, that'd be amazing because that means I learned something today. That's be cool. Try going behind the sun. Does the back of the sun also get lighted that way? Uh, or below the sun? Because the hemisphere light has to, like, it, it literally is a, a half a sphere, so it has to light from one direction, but it, I don't see, you would have to have a second hemisphere light to actually light from the other direction as well. Hmm. Anyhow, well, that's really cool. Cool. Um, yeah, so to make it glow, you would have to, oh, what the hell. Uh, you would have to use a component to actually make that work and I would not necessarily use that because it will definitely have a performance impact. Are there custom shaders available? You can write your own shaders and there are probably custom shaders available for glowing somewhere. Um, like when, when you use our 3D models you actually get uh, a different shader than the 3JS uh, or A-frame shaders because we do light maps differently. I mean, there's other types of light as well. You don't only have the um, the point light. You also have the hemisphere light. You also have the directive light, uh, directional light. Jesus, and you can then start to like experiment with things. So, for instance, we might want to do something slightly different. I'm actually not going to remove all of this, but I'm going to comment it out so that it doesn't get in our way. Um, so I'm going to leave the sky in because it's kind of nice to have the sky here. So what I can do is uh, I can have an A entity geometry primitive plane. And I, oh God, I can never remember. I'm going to do it like this and I'm going to see what happens. Um, because I can never remember which way I have to rotate it to make it look the way I want to make it look like. So I'm going to start with this and I'm going to figure out the rotation by just like turning it and see it's negative. Okay, fair enough. Uh, so we're going to rotate this rotation zero, no, sorry, uh, minus 90, zero, zero. So we're rotating around the X axis and I'm going to I'm going to give this one a width of 100 and a height of, or depth, I think it's depth, depth of 100. So now we have like a plane that is our ground plane and I'm actually not seeing it and that might be because I might have done something that is wrong. Right, it's not depth, in that case it is, is it height? That's like a super weird, yeah okay, fair enough. And you see like I didn't give it a, a material yet and immediately 3JS as a, I keep saying 3JS, Jesus Christ. A-frame jumps in and for our ground, so I'm, we now have created a ground plane um, and for that to like look like something, it just generates a color 
uh, and make sure that we are we are seeing it. But I can also give it like a material. I can say I don't know. Uh, I want this to be color zero zero pff, AA zero zero. So we have a bit of that. Um, now I can actually make that white. Whoopsa! Shit. Make that white. No, not hashtag white. Um, and I can create a light. Light and position it somewhere and I'm just going to position it. Actually, I don't have to position it, I think. Um, I wanted a different light. I wanted a directional light. And again, I can never remember the parameters. So I'm just going to check them out here. Directional, what kind of direction does it automatically go to? The example below creates. Shining from the upper left at a 45 degree angle. Where do, does the 45 degree, ah, right, okay, ah, right, yes, yes, yes. Because the directional light is basically, it's not quite like the sun actually works, but it's basically like light coming from some direction and going towards the origin. So the position doesn't actually matter that much, it, and it, except for we need to figure out like the, the, the difference between where the light is positioned and the origin is the direction that the light is going to shine in towards. So if I say zero, one, zero, the light is going to come from the top and shine to the bottom because this is our ground and this is our light. So the li this is the, the difference between the light position and the origin position. So it's going to shine in that direction from the top. And I give it a color. Oh yeah, let's do something vapor wavy. Let's go, um, ha, huh. let's try AA, zero, zero, AA. And then we do a second light, same light, uh, except for I do a different color and I do a different position. So now this light's shining from the bottom up and so we have a magenta light shining down from, from above and another light shining up. And now we put a, 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 an additional entity in, a entity geometry primitive sphere material color white oops color white and we position that in front of our camera so that we actually see it and actually maybe i move it up a little bit as well so that we see something and hey the 80s called No, nah, that's too much. Still too much. No way, what? Okay, it's like super, super intensive. Better. So like, yeah, the 80s call, they want their models back. And this is how you do Vaporwave. <laughs> um, and you could also now like, uh, let, let me actually see. So I go to images, google.com and I need a grid image that is nicely tileable. Now that's all bullshit. I just need a, oh, God damn it. Tile. Ah, this is not what I am looking for. Right. You know what? I'll do it myself because I'm a great graphical artist. Uh, this is going to be fun. Ugh, come on. I can't be bothered to buy Adobe products. So I'm like, yeah, GIMP it is. And I was like, you, who the fuck, why would you use GIMP? And I'm like, Just, you know, let me do my thing. I know what I'm doing. No, I actually don't, but you know, it's kind of cool anyway. So uh, let's use black and then use white to create a little bit of, a, oh Jesus Christ, how do I make this? Grid pattern tileable. So it's like 256 pixels. It's like 128. So I go like 124 to 132. It's like, no, it's actually pretty tiny, but it's going to be fine, I guess. And then just like drag it like here. I'm going to share the, the URL to this particular beautiful image in a second so that you don't have to do like this complicated uh, image editing process. 
I'm just gonna copy the layer here and then just actually, no, actually I can duplicate the layer and then, no, I can't because it's not transparent. Ah, Jesus Christ. Ah. Make it transparent, put it in here, and then I do like layer, rotate, 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 90% clockwise, here we go. So this is my grid, hurrah. Okay, cool, so export as PNG. Yeah, let's call it grid. Why is it, why is it putting it into documents? No, don't put it into documents. This is not a document, this is a, this is terrible. Um, but it's okay, I, I got this. <coughs> Jesus. So we put this into assets. Uh, where's like the upload thing? There's an, ah, here. From computer, I go to downloads, I go to grid, I upload my grid, ta-da. And I can now go to my grid, which is this one. I should probably give it an ID so that I can just easier identify later on. Uh, and I can give my ground a different material where I'm saying like source is this wonderful your oops. What? Uploading URL? No, don't. No, don't. You, pfft, Jesus. Okay, great. Now I have it like five times. Um, I get the URL from the asset and I put it in here. And whoa, okay. This is like gigantic now. This is not what I wanted. Okay. Let's do like, oh, I can't remember. I, I think it's like repeat 1010 or something like that. Is that? Yes. Right? <laughs> okay, now we have, we have fully gone vapor wave here. We can make the overall scene a little less dark by adding another light, uh, like a, a really, really gentle A entity light type ambient color 66666. Yes, that looks like enough sixes. Um, uh, that's too bright actually already, so let's, let's actually make that darker. Yeah, it's still, still pretty bright. Yeah, that's nicer. Um, so yeah, hurrah. This is the kind of stuff that you get to create and then like walk around and then have a lot of fun. Um, Could you show the tag for the ground again? Yes, the ground is a. Actually, let me let me fix that a little bit so that's not as as hard to read uh, on the projector. Let's move it around here, and then like rotation, and then the material with a certain source, and that should be it. Yes. Okay. Cool. So yeah. Um, oh, ah. Oh no. Oh shit. Is it all lost now? It is probably all lost now. Oh no. Actually, it's not because no, it is all lost. <laughs> no, I, I think I think I think it isn't because it must have been saved because I was able to actually go to it on my phone. So it was like fortunate something something. Yeah, I think the editor auto saves. If you're logged in, I think I don't know. I wasn't logged in, so that's like that was the danger, stranger danger. Um, let's see, fortunate tendency. Okay. Fortunate tendency dot glitch dot me. If that's still there, then we should be good. And it's still there, so we should be good. So let's see, it's like glitch me. And then like this, I know it's actually glitch.com, isn't it? Ah. The naming convention never <laughs> occurred to me. It's like, oh, look at that. I, <gasps> woo. I'm not signed in, but it magically figures out that it's me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Glitch, because that was like not expected to happen. Um, so yeah, we have a plane, we give it a certain width and height, uh, we rotate it minus 90 degrees around the x-axis so that it actually faces upwards, uh, and then we give it a material with the given grid image. If you want to use the grid image, I can create a short URL if you want. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> so you know it's super like I totally have the uh, no not that uh, I totally have the copyright on that but I'm I'm okay I think I make it public domain <laughs> I don't I won't make you pay for it it's like it's probably uh, to be honest the thing is actually better like than like a per, like one percent of the of the uh, stock photos are just like shit 
So I think this is actually better. Like, you know, there's stock photos where you're like, what the hell? Women laughing at salad is one of my favorite ones. It's like, what? Again, don't use the short URL. If you use the short URL in the thing, it's very likely to not work because it does like a redirect instead of actually giving you the, the thing and then the, that breaks um, cross-origin sharing, I think. Right. Any questions so far? Could you go back to the code? I could totally do that. Anything particular you're missing? If you don't put a width and a height in the plane, you will just extend infinitely? Or no, it will be like one by one meter. You can also use scale to scale it up. Um, but that, that means that basically you're like stretching it a lot and that's not necessarily going to look great with textures. With texture, yeah. yeah. I assume this is your habit that you write A entity instead of writing like A light? Um, so I kind of prefer that because it makes clear that uh, light is a component on its own that you can attach to pretty much any entity that you wish to. Um, but technically, there's not much of a difference. There is the pitfall here is for certain entities, there are differences. For instance, writing a camera is not a good idea because of the way that the camera component system interacts with the scene. So it's like, it's a, it's a little tricky um, and whoops. Is someone co-editing this right now? Because I'm not exactly sure where the color comes from. Like, is, is someone highlighting? Can I see? Is there someone like... Oh yeah, look at that. Hi. Uh, very nice meeting y'all. Interesting. Um, <laughs> Interesting. I did not know that Glitch can do that, but it's cool to, to figure that one out. Um, no, so it's also like, uh, I, I saw a lot of people got like super confused. Um, for instance, when you do like A entity, uh, and then people are like color, blue, and they're like, it doesn't work anymore. Why does it not work? And I'm like, well, because it's an A entity and color is not a component that it can use by its own. It only works when you use it with a primitive component. So I kind of prefer that style. Actually, to be honest, when I write A frame component, uh, A frame code, I usually don't do that but I find it easier to teach that way because it's like con consistent uh, and you always do it like that. I mean, I made an ex uh, ex uh, ex um, exception for the sky because I couldn't be bothered to actually look up how the, the sky material thing works. Because it's just like not really useful in most cases. Also, by the way, we, don't, we are not constrained to use like the things that A-Frame comes with. So there's the thing um, called the A-Frame Component Registry, and I'm actually not sure, I've never used it in the inspector, so I'm gonna see how that works. So we can add things to the scene in the inspector. So we can say like, add a new thing. And this is an entity, so it's an empty nothing thing, right? So it doesn't have anything attached to it, so we can't really see any of, of what it has. And um, I'm actually wondering if I'm able to, ah, oh, this is interesting. So it has all the components that, that A-Frame comes with. Uh, but it also have this, has this uh, A-frame component registry. And in the component registry, you can search for things. For instance, I can search for an environment, and I find this. And it allows me to, to basically like get the URL of the component, and I can copy this. I should have actually copied it on the, on the thing before. So again, like if you add something, you can see all the components that A-frame comes with. And we also actually see like the IO 3D components because we have loaded IO, uh, 3D IO into our scene as well. So here we have all the wonderful A-frame components. And then you have like the A-frame registry next to it. And it gives you an overview of all the different available components. And there's like a lot of them. Um, here you see, for instance, like an ocean or a uh, force graph, gaze control, yada, 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 layouts. Leap hands, if you have a leap motion, 
yeah so there's like lots of these components available which is like super nice and uh, I have just copied one and I'm gonna go here and after our scripts I'm gonna do like script this is super confusing whoever highlighted this thing can you please unhighlight it <laughs> it's just nice <laughs> So what I, again, what I have done is in the A-Frame Inspector, I clicked on A-Frame Registry and I looked for Environment and you get this component here. And I think they actually also have like previews. <coughs> yes. So here we have a preview of the component, what it does, uh, how to load it and how to use it. And here it says like it has a bunch of pre presets and has a bunch of parameters and yada, yada, yada. So I just loaded this J J uh, JavaScript into my scripts, uh, sorry, into my documents. It's A-frame environment component. And now I can use it in my scene. And I probably want to remove my, uh, my ground because I'm relatively sure that the ground, actually also the lights probably, because I'm relatively sure that it's going to collide with uh, what the what the component does. So if I'm now going back and reload, oh, I magically lost reload capability. So I probably want to do like show live. All right. So now this component creates an environment, which is like very nice. And as we've seen in the uh, A-frame inspector, even for these components that are not A-frame components built by A-frame themselves, but actually built by um, built by by the community, you get to see all the parameters in the A-frame inspector. So we can now explore and try things out. So for instance, we can use a different preset. Let's use Tron. And then you get like this Tron-y environment. It's a bit weird, but okay. I don't like these weird towers. So let's find out what these towers are. Where are they coming from? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, ground spikes. Maybe what happens when I say like hills instead? All right, okay, no, I, that's not the. Okay, that's not what I wanted. So I, I kind of want to do like spikes. Is okay. Ah, dressing towers. I don't like towers. I like trees. Make no sense. Mushrooms are like super weird in this case. So how about? Ooh, okay, yeah. No, that's very nice, uh, but not what I want. So can I say like nothing? Oh, cubes. No, that looks even worse. Um, let's go with nothing. So you get to like explore different things. Like this, this environment component is really nice because you don't have to do much and you get like a nice environment. Um, if you're not that much into like cyberpunky things, then what you can do is you can also uh, try, I think there's like forest somewhere and there's like actually a nice forest. Here we go. Forest and then you have like a brightly lit scene. So you don't really have to build your own environments. You can use one of these templates if you really quickly want to uh, like build something up. But I highly recommend at least like trying to build your own environments because it's kind of fun and gives you like a more, a better feeling for the, the thing you are creating, I, I'd say. Fortunate tendency, all right, okay. Um, if we wanted to get that into, <coughs> into our code, we should be able to just say like copy this and I'm gonna oh geez. You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna remix this. <laughs> Don't you dare. <laughs> you read my mind. Don't you dare. Okay, um So this is actually like dragging in everything that it generates. So what you see here is there's a bit of a, an interesting secret in this one. So what we've seen in the inspector, if you look closely, is that this actually generates a bunch of more entities, right? So I had an entity uh, with like a, the an environment component, but it actually generates a bunch of entities inside. And I can either keep them or I can remove them and it's going to regenerate them. Uh, that's basically up to me. But yeah, so your components could theoretically create more. Uh, whoops. Okay, this is not exactly what I wanted. More, more things inside. So this component is actually slightly buggy because it should not. 
Uh, do, it should figure out that it has children and then just reuse the children, but instead it's actually generating them on top of each other. Okay. What the hell? I think I'm just gonna remove everything except for the um, for the pre preset. So that's let's just not have that. Yeah. Okay. Better. Um, by the way, if you ever see like weird things happen, let's 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 try something. I want to show you something uh, and explain to you why it happens because that's some some of the problems that I keep seeing people having. So let's say like color red. So now we have two skies, right? We have this sky that is red and we have this sky that is dark blue. And what happens is, and I'm not sure if it's going to happen that, no, it's, it's not violently happening, which is nice. Um, okay, in that case, let's, let's not show it in the, in the thingy. And what instead I'm doing is I'm, do, I'm doing this. I'm going to copy the sphere and I'm going to give this a red meta, uh, material. Ah, dang, it's not happening, which is nice, but it's also not what I expected. Um, I scale this slightly smaller, maybe scale 0 0.99, 0 0.99, 0 0.99. Because what I try to show you is if you have two entities that are overlapping quite exactly. Ah, huh, this is interesting. This is still not happening. 0 0.001. Hmm. It's interesting that I can't demo it when I really, really want it. But if, if I don't want it to happen, then it happens. This is like typical. Uh, what I'm trying to show you is like Z fighting, but I can't actually reproduce the problem. <laughs> Great. Um, basically, what you want to look out for is if things are starting to flicker. That's normally when two objects are kind of like on the same position. And because it's the same position, the rendering engine has to kind of decide on random which one to draw at the last one. So it's not guaranteed to be drawn in the same order. So basically, it then like starts to fight over who's going to be drawn first and last. And that starts to like flicker, especially when you move. Um, when you see that, it's normally because two things are on the same position. Uh, it can also be a problem in 3D models. When 3D artists are not careful enough, they might actually accidentally create two faces on top of each other. And then that exactly is what happens. Um, good. One last thing that I'd like to uh, show you before we, we um, try to do something in, in VR, uh, or I, I give you the time to actually explore VR a little bit if you're interested, is I want to show you how to write your own components. Because surprisingly, it's not that hard. It's not like super obvious, but it's not that hard because there's really, really good documentation um, that explains it really, really well. So what I'm going to do is I'm first going to get our nice uh, Nice steam back because I kind of liked it. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Um, oh, one, one, more th one, blah, one more thing before I do that. There's also an A text component that gives you the possibility to actually create text. Uh, it works slightly different than you might want, uh, expect. Um, the text component is documented in here as well as it's part of the uh, text. Um, uh, sorry, uh, part of the A-frame distribution. Um, you can use Google fonts and stuff with it. If you use an additional, um, an additional uh, component for that, and it has like these fonts, uh, font faces built in, basically. So that that works as well. You can also generate fonts from it. I only always found that to be like confusing and weird, so I never did it. But um, you can hypothetically do that. And how it works is you position it as anything else you would position. So let's say like 0, 2, minus 2. And then you give it the text. Ah, shit, that is actually incorrect. It's an A entity. See, that's what I meant with like being consistent. Uh, A entity. And you give it the text component and you give it a value. And in the value, you say like, hello world. And then where is it? It doesn't show up because I think I forgot to give it a material as well. To a color white. Do I have to give it a font? No. Oh, probably our sphere is in the way, isn't it? Ah, uh, bum. Dash, dash. Yeah, there it is. Hi there. 
There's also an external component. So this, this one has one downside. Uh, it has an upside as well. Performance-wise, this is really nice because it just basically renders a single uh, face. But on the other hand, it doesn't have any depth, right? And if you're standing behind it, well, right, it's gone. Um, so if you want to have something more like thick and, and, and uh, with a bit of depth, then there's like the A text geometry which is really nice, but it has the downside of actually rendering more triangles. So it's like a, a bit of a, you have to figure out what, what makes more sense in this particular case. Um, you can also render two dimensional images as well. There's like an A image uh, component that actually renders a single image that floats in space. You can also do that. Um, I think I haven't done that yet, but it's not too, like, too exciting. But if you have like regular images that you want to have like an image gallery or something like that, then you can do that by basically saying a entity image and then you give it like a source and you can also give it a width actually like I don't know a JPEG and you give it a width like 0 0.5 which is like half a meter height it's like I don't know 0 0.25 or whatever and you position that as well so that's not like super exciting uh, but I wanted you to know that this exists it's not only 360 degree images you can also do like uh, normal 2d images so what I'd like to do is I'd like to get our, I don't need the defer, um, our script used. So if we want to create a A-frame component, we do that using the A-frame, uh, is it A-frame or is it like A-frame? I can never remember, I think it's A-frame. Uh, register component. And we give that an object. And um, I think we also give it a name, and yes, we give it a name and an object. So basically, I would call this planets. I don't know. We would have to figure this one out. Um, so let's give it like a planets component. And the first thing that we have to do is we have to figure out our schema. So if you remember, we had in the inspector, we had like all of these different properties, right? That we could set like the material it had like color and the geometry had like primitive. Our component might have the same and we want to define it in here. So let's say in our, in our um, planets thing, we might want to give it the number of planets that are, or let's actually call it solar system, that makes more sense, solar system, the number of planets, and for the inspector to figure out what kind of data this is, we have to give it like a bit of help. So number is any number including floating point numbers, but that makes no sense because we can't have 3.5 planets, that does not really work. So let's use int which is any integer number. We can also give it a default value. If it's not specified, it should have a default value, and I say this one, it can be two, it doesn't matter. It's just like that's going to be the default. And we can have multiple of these. We can have, I don't know, um, moving, shall have like type, I think it's Boolean, I'm never sure, and default shall be true. So this is how we define the properties that our, our component will have. And A-frame has two methods that it's going to call on this. One is the init function that's going to be called initially. And it's the update function that is called whenever some, something's changing. Oh, I forgot a comma here. I'm sorry for that. So let's just start like with the update function and call like Updating solar system. It's not very exciting. It's not doing anything uh, interesting just yet, but it does log something to the console so we can figure out if our component would be working. So again, in the schema, we're defining all the properties that our component will have. And then we have an init function and an update function um, to well create the thing initially and then afterwards whenever it needs updating we can update it I 
hear violent typing. So I'll wait a moment. So now we're not really using this component. Um, so we wanna wanna change our index HTML to actually use this component. So let's say like we have an A entity and we have a solar system. Now if we reload, we're not seeing anything because we haven't created anything yet, right? We haven't done anything visible, but in a console it says updating solar system. Yay! So basically this is the moment when the uh, component is, is basically getting like uh, updated information on what it should be doing based on the schematics. And if we now go into our in inspector, actually let me remove this and go into the inspector, and we select the entity, which should probably be this one, then we see that the properties that we've given it in the schema appear here, right? And I can change them and I can say four. And I can say I don't want them moving. So you see that based on the type that we've given, the, the interface actually updates. And it has a few nice things. Like I said four, but I can also like drag and then it, it increases in steps of one because we said it's an integer number, so it doesn't do like floating point numbers in this case. And if we look at our console again, then we see that it has been called more often now that we change it. And if I change this again, you know, you see like any time this information changes. Um, it is actually changing uh, or updating our components. It's calling this function that we have in our component. We can also do that manually, and I'm not exactly sure if this is going to work the way that I want it to work. So let's see, like, I want all A entities. Yes, thank you. And I want the one that is, I should have given it an, oh shit, I should have given it a, um, an ID so that it's easier for me, but it, this looks right. So components lists all the components that this particular entity has. And here's our solar system component. So we can go in and say solar system. And now in the solar system component, we have data. And data is exactly what we enter here, right? These two match. So if I now type in like five here and I call it again, then we see like number of planets is now five. So you can programmatically access and change this information. Not that you should do that, but you can. And then you can also manually like call update. So I can actually go in here and say like solar system dot data dot moving equals true. And I think it was false before. And then we can call update on it. And um, okay, the inspector doesn't update. That's an interesting one. But if I now close and open the inspector again, then it's actually updating the inspector. There must be a leak somewhere. Cool, but this is not interesting, right? We haven't actually rendered anything. We haven't done anything interesting in our um, in our component. So can you can we do something interesting here? Yes, we can. Hell yes. So how about this? How about we go in and um, say this, which is the component. Um, get. Oh God, is it like get object 3D or is it get 3D object? I can never remember the syntax here. Let's, let's check. Uh, is it like get object 3D? 3D? Get object? No? Ah! Get 3D object? <laughs> okay, time to look at the documentation. Uh, I'm so sorry, but it's like, to be honest, everyone reads the documentation all the time. And I, I'm not going to lie to you and be like, oh, I learned this by heart. No, I just, we're not in school here. Come on. Um, set object 3D and get object 3D. So, okay, it's like with an uppercase D. All right. So, basically what we can do is we want to create our own um, things. And there's two ways of doing this. As I said, A-frame is wrapping around 3JS. So if you happen to know the 3JS library, then you can use that. So what we can do is we can, for instance, say var mesh equals new 3 mesh. So mesh is basically the exact same concept as an entity in, in uh, uh, A-frame. It's just then a different term for it. And then if you like 3 box geometry, 1, 1, 1. So this is like the geometry, so here we have that, and then we need a material, we learned that earlier on. 
So actually, let me reformat that a little bit so that's a little easier to see. So like it's a mesh basic material. And by default, that's going to be white, so that's going to be OK. And then we close this one. And then we say like this, set object 3D mesh. And now our component actually explodes because this set object, OK, right? Ah, is, is it? Ah, uh, maybe I'm an idiot. Let's see. I might just be an idiot. No, I'm not an idiot. OK, cool. That gives me this element set object 3D. Ah, right. No, it takes an, ah, damn it. Because it can have multiple of these. We're just going to go like the mesh shall be this mesh. And then, hey, look at that. Our solar system is now a white box. Uh, very exciting. Um, I'm dying of happiness. Um, this is this is one way of doing it, and it's definitely the more flexible way. But you, that means that you have to learn 3JS to write your own components. But what if I tell you that's not true? Another way of doing this kind of thing is by saying, "Look at that. We have this element is actually the HTML element that we're in." So we can append children to it. Now, how do we create one? Well, it's, it's an HTML element. So what we can do is we can say, OK, I, w I want the sun, because we have to have a sun. We are a solar system. We have to have a sun. Come on. Um, I want the sun to be a, an A-frame element, an A entity. So we create an instance of an, of an A entity tag, which is what the DOM does behind the scenes anyways when we're writing the HTML. And then I can say like sunset attribute. Uh, let's say like emissive. Oops. Uh, oh, this is not what I wanted. Sorry for that. Emissive yellow. Oops. Uh, what the hell? And then we append the sun <laughs> to the current element. So emissive is a property of light, or we can use that directly? Uh, you can actually use that. Oh sh shit! No, you're right. I'm an idiot. It's a uh, it's the material component that has like emissive yellow. Sorry, that was my, my bad. Very good point. Very good for pointing that one out before I'm like, what the hell is going on here? And by the way, I, I kind of want to move this around a little bit. So right now it's under our camera. It's also like not very nice. So let's move this around a tiny little bit so that we actually see it in front of us. Aha. Uh -huh. Why is it not doing it? Oh, because we... <laughs> Yeah, another thing is obviously uh, I forgot to set another component, which is the geometry component. So yeah, that was not very smart. Um, geometry primitive sphere. So we're literally like using the DOM API to create this for us. And here we are. And then what we could do is uh, we can move forward. So let's let's say like four var i equals zero, i is smaller, this dot data dot number of planets i plus plus. We're gonna like var planet equals document create element a entity. So this is this is now starting to get repetitive hopefully. Um that actually, basically it's screw this crap. I'm like just gonna you know screw it. Let's let's do that. Um for the sake of simplicity, we're just going to make them all, I don't know, red. <laughs> um, it's not sun anymore, it's planet. That was my bad. Copy and pasta error. And then we say like sun append child planet. Also, we probably want to move the planet a little like somewhere else. So we do like set attribute 
position is like uh, let's go like I times 2.5 meters plus whoa that's the better in the way now zero zero Yes, I'm adding an initial offset, so we're now moving them a little off and then we are pending the, the planet to the sun. Uh, there's a bit of a problem now that... Um, wait, where's my planet? No! I do not get my planet. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's... Be ah, that's what you meant with an offset, yes. I they. Okay, right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, 2.5 plus i times 2.5 so that we do not start with zero there we go it's quite large isn't it uh so maybe we want to do like planet planet set attribute scale to like i don't know um 0 0.25 0. Point, oops 0 0.25 0. 0.25 so that we get like a smaller planet but basically that's that's it uh we would now have to work out how to deal with this when the number of planets changes. Um, alternatively, we could always like recalculate. I mean, the, the number of, of planets is probably not gonna change as often. So what we could do instead is we could say like, okay, so the sun is not, never gonna change, so we don't have to do this. Uh, so what we can do is we can say like, instead of sun, actually we can do like that, and then like this sun equals sun, so that we have a reference from it. Uh, and then we take this off into the uh, the update function. And what we can do theoretically is we can say like this dot sun dot inner HTML. There is definitely better ways of doing this, but like for the sake of simplicity, this is fine. <laughs> so like this dot sun, uh, because what should be happening now if I'm not oh, wow what. Oh, is it calling? Wait, 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 wait. Am I doing something stupid right now? Because I probably no, am. Uh, I think actually it's oh, shit. It might actually be. Oh, my my tab died. Good night. Um, it might actually call it when we are updating the the children, but I'm not sure it shouldn't actually. So let's see. Ha! Huh, now it doesn't. Now it works fine. Okay, whatever. Um, well, no, this is the wrong. Nope, still the wrong key. Hello? Ah, there we go. Um, control Alt I. So if I now zoom, 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 if I now go in here and I say, okay, this thing here shall have three planets, then I'm wondering what's happening. Ah, there we go. Three planets. Surprise, surprise. And then we could do like all the, the, the animations and all that. Basically, the tree can get more complicated and then we could move it if moving is true. So you can build these these components like that and I prefer it over the 3JS way for most of the things because it's, it's how components can easily uh, kind of be composed together to build more complicated components but then again if you really need the 3JS objects don't shy away from them it's not as complicated this is still a really nice um, uh, abstraction over the raw WebGL also you can do things like you can actually query the children inside of your components so you can say like if you want to change the way that the sun looks or if you want to give me a different entity for the sun then just give it an i don't know class or something uh, and then i can just load that from what you give me instead of creating myself yeah it's yeah it's, it's possible there's also a callback in co uh, components have a callback that is called when the children change so you can even observe that so uh, it's it's a really flexible system and uh, the dom makes this relatively easy to actually build this kind of thing so we can get to all of these components through the dom yes they're all represented. yes they're all represented in the dom there's one exception so as i said like the a frame does these optimizations um for the attributes so uh they they turn it turns the attributes the different component attributes into objects which the dom does not support right so you have instead of position as a string 0, 0, 0, you actually have an object x, y, z, 0, 0, 0. Um, 
it doesn't always update the DOM immediately. So if you really, really need to export that to the DOM, there's a function called flush to DOM that you can call to actually get like the string versions back into the DOM. That's causing a little bit of a frame rate, rate drop for us, like for half a second or something, whatever. Um, but if you really need to export it, that's the way to go. Like I've seen people who have like an editor where you put something together and then you click a button and then you get like a text field with the HTML inside and they're like, oh, it's missing all my information because it's not, unless it goes like solar system equals empty string. And it's like, no, there's information in here. Like number of planets should be five and is moving should be false. And you can use flush to DOM to make that happen, like to make it flush it out as a string to fix can that we problem. Set the individual, so here we've been setting like the whole position string at once. Can we set just the X or just the Y? If you can do that by using the, the JavaScript method that I uh, used early on. So basically what you would do uh, is you would go like, um, let's, let's just do like pseudocode. Yeah, entity, components, position, data, z equals five. And then you would have to, yes, I know it's not an actual, actual thing. You would then have to call update manually to make sure that it's actually like reflected in the component. But that's totally possible. No, I don't want to, what? No, go away. Um, so yes, it's lunchtime. I already, no, actually I did not steal any minutes yet. It's like th we have three more minutes. Do you have any questions, anything else that I should cover? Yeah. Quick one, what would you recommend for documentation? Because for example, for light, just looking at the A-frame docs, it doesn't describe the types of light. Are you sure about that? Uh, when I went to like the light, it said. It oh, should. I guess it's a drop down on the side for different types. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, we have like them here listed out in in quite a bit of detail actually. So just A-Frame.io? Yeah, A-Frame a -frame documentation is really good. Um, there's, a, there's a Slack for A-Frame. Um, you find the links in, in the a -frame, on the A-Frame site, actually. So like here's a community tab uh, that has like the documentation, GitHub, uh, Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow is also really, really great um, to if you have actual questions. Um, but the Slack is really, really helpful as well. If you have any questions, you get quick help there. Uh, yeah. Go to meetup groups that are doing stuff like that. If you have some some nearby, I don't actually know if there's that many meetup groups around A-Frame yet, but I would I would recommend the Slack if there's anything that's not clear in the documentation. Because to be honest, like the the project is relatively young, it's in like it's probably like a year old maybe now, or maybe like one and a half or whatever. It's, it's not that old yet, uh, so there is holes here and there. But everyone's like super helpful in, in making sure that you understand everything. There's a few Mozilla people at the back, by the way. Um, <laughs> hi, <laughs> long time to see. Um, and like everyone's like super helpful. And if you find something that's missing, uh, all the documentation is on GitHub, so you can literally just ed edit the page and make a pull request, and then make it better for everyone. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. Who's staying for the after afternoon workshop? It's a few people, uh, I think. So theoretically, they're all full, but I highly recommend if you're really interested in, just stay for the afternoon workshop. You might get a seat if you're lucky. <laughs> um, just stay around and see if there's like spots left uh, and then just, you know, hang out because it's going to be super cool. It's going to be an advanced workshop and you're going to do the, the city thing, right? Yes. Yeah, I mean, the reason why I'm super excited about A-Frame and why we are also actually excited about it at 3D.io is that it's relatively easy with a few lines of code to actually build things like this, for instance. So we have like uh, an application that loads this entire thing and you have like camera tours uh, that take you to the different rooms. Let's go to like bedroom two. I don't even know which one it is. Oh, it's that one. Okay, fair enough. And um, if you look at the code, it's actually not that complicated. So you have a bunch of CSS. Okay, cool. Yes, sure. Um, and afterwards, you have a bit of 
a bit of uh, um, whoops shit what the hell is my <laughs> no why is it navigating when I don't want to navigate and then you have like um, a bunch of buttons you have a logo here which is literally just an image uh, you have a map which is like the the, um, the thing and then you have the buttons that that use aframe components here you see exactly what I showed earlier on like components.tour it has a go-to method it goes to a certain bookmark uh, and then it just does the magic in, in A-frame. And the A-frame code itself is, wow, Jesus Christ. My, my computer goes bananas. No, don't navigate away when I try to, what the heck? Okay, right. Um, the A-frame code itself is basically, you have the camera, you have the different tool waypoints, and uh, you have like a light, and you have here, this is the apartment, and that's it, right? It's like, it starts here, and the actual scene is done here and the rest is just like specific like tw you know, like tweaks and nice niceties so it's not that much code it's not that hard to get there uh, and you can basically build like really really cool stuff really quickly and it's like super flexible huh so what's yes so check out your local communities uh, check out meetup and just play around. I think the most important thing is to just like start playing around with it. Thank you very much. Enjoy lunch. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, I'll be around at lunch.